Welcome to EVA, the Royal Academy of Engineering Sciences. I'm Tuula Teireen, I'm president of EVA. EVA was founded 100 years ago and a couple of years, uh, 1919, uh, and was at that time the first uh, Academy of Engineering in the world. What inspired the kind of founders of EVA uh, was the so-called peat bubble, the first major energy crisis uh, in Sweden during the early 1900s. Uh, what that peat crisis did was that it made the Swedish politicians aware of a need of science-based advice to support that time industrial renewal. And now over a hundred years ago, EVA has grown into a community of over 1,000 elected fellows, both in Sweden and beyond. Uh, we are fellows uh, that we elect uh, uh, who are the best uh, experts uh, in engineering and economic sciences, and not only the sciences, but also industrial development. We build our advice to politicians uh, on facts as we know them. We are o m many of us researchers, but I we say that we, you, we rely on the best uh, understanding that science can contribute when we uh, give policy advice. And of course, as you know, we are uh, having many, many uh, very grave challenges, this time on the global scale, not only in Sweden, but everywhere. The climate change, the loss of biodiversity, pandemic, and right now, of course, the devastating war in Europe. A, a war that forces us to speed up the energy transition and many, many other transitions that, that are in front of us. So the question is then how Sweden can contribute to this much needed sustainable development and at the same time secure our own competitiveness. And if we look at our unique assets, I think it's fair to say that forests represent a resource that we really know how to handle in Sweden. We, something that started with logging and timber has given rise to many, many decades of successful pulp and paper industry. And this development now continues with the sustainable building materials and also a whole range of different kinds of high-tech products such as composites, hygiene products, packaging materials and textiles, all in the spirit of sustainable development which is so much in demand today. So, um, in the middle of these crises and uh, different opportunities, we can ask ourselves whether it might now be uh, an, an era that is starting that we could call the golden twenties of the wood products industry, a second coming, if you like. My, my own uh, forest industrial journey began uh, in the early 80s, uh, which was actually a dawn of uh, gene technology, but also a dawn of forest industrial biotechnology. We were working with uh, trying to understand how you could degrade cellulose with enzymes and also understand the complex structure of the plant cell walls. And also then uh, this knowledge that we acquired was, was leading to ideas of how this knowledge could give rise to new innovations in this uh, branch of industry. We had many dreams uh, those days, and uh, many people felt that those dreams were unrealistic. We talked about high-performance materials, and for instance, one of the things that uh, we often, uh, in packaging industry, we were facing a question, can't you come up with some kind of materials that we could package Coke or beer in? And we were ourselves laughing, because we thought that that would be very difficult. But now there are these kind of Coke bottles now being manufactured that can hold also uh, coke and beer. And, and after 20 years of research, not, of course not only in Sweden, but also in other forest industrial nations, these dreams really are entering the industrial production as, as we will partially be hearing today. It's a evidence of an industrial transition ha that has taken place in about 100 years, which Sweden is leading and which has led to a very large scale process industry to also spread its tentacles to consumer products, which also was something we didn't quite believe uh, uh, in the 80s. So I'm really looking forward to the discussions of today and 
I will give the word now to Eva Pettersson, who is the CEO of our sister academy, Royal Swedish Academy of Agriculture and Forestry. Eva, please. Thank you very much, Tula, and I'm really glad to be here in this joint seminar. And it's not the first time that we used to have joint seminars. We used to cooperate with all our sister academies, and today it's, it's Eva. So my name is Eva Peterson, and as Tula said, I'm the CEO of uh, KSLA. Uh, and I'll just give you a very brief uh, introduction to what KSLA is. And I do agree also that uh, the, the climate in the world is quite tough, both versus climate as well as wars, and et cetera. And, and the green section uh, is really has its uh, eyes on it at the moment. So I think we have an in, in important um, work to do within the acad academy. And um, I'm supposed to do this myself, right? There we go. Uh, we have uh, a mission that we are working with in all the activities that we are doing within the academy. is the task to promote agriculture and forestry and associated activities with the support of science and practical experience and in the interest of the society. We were um, installed at um, 1813, so we are a little bit younger than Eva. And uh, from the beginning, we were installed because we had a famine in the world or in, in Sweden, so we needed to have some, some sort of platform for, for the agriculture in Sweden, so therefore the acad academy was installed. And today, uh, we are a free and independent organization, and we are working with issues of agriculture, horticulture, food, forest and forest product, fishing and aquaculture, as well as the environment, of course, and natural resources, because this is what we are working with. And as I said, we are a little bit few. We are 710 elected fellows today, and we are divided into three sections. It's agriculture, forestry and the general issues. But we are working as one academy and in all the issues that we are talking about, we would like to interact with each other. So, so it's not uh, so that we are solely working within one, one section within the academy. But today it's the forest section and I would like just shortly to introduce what the forest section are do is doing. And, uh, uh, the section deals with issues concerning silviculture and the utilization of the forest as a natural resource, including industry, marketing and fields of application in theory and practice specific educational and advisory issues, hunting and env environmental issues related to this sector. So it's quite wide. We are doing all kinds of things and this is what forest is too. So I think it's dealing with that quite well. I will just give you some short example what we are doing at the moment within KSLA and within the forest section and also of course together with the other sections then. It's, it's wildlife management. Uh, this, has, um, this is an important thing that we are doing. There are quite a lot of damages within agriculture and also in forestry. So I think that this is an important thing. And uh, we've had a group working with that with several sem seminars and also excursions in this matter. Forest damages and climate change, of course. This is high, <laughs> is high, high on the priori priority list, of course. And these are things that we are talking about almost every day. It concerns also agriculture, of course, and the adjustment to a new climate um, a situation that we are dealing with in the world. And biodiversity in Sweden. And this also concerns both forestry, but we are starting to work with the forestry, but also agriculture. Uh, I mean, the companies that are dealing with forestry, they do also very often have, have um, agriculture. So therefore, I mean, it's, it's an important thing that we are working together in that matter. Uh, we also work quite a lot with coverage of the EU work within the Green Deal and input on various EU proposals that specifically actually has affect forestry. And here we have done quite hard work during the two, two latest years. And uh, we've tried to give some input and try also to, to tell the EU representatives 
how it is in Sweden and, and in Finland as well. Um, it's hard to exactly um, compare those things. So we are trying to affect as much as we can. Uh, we have also had quite a lot of seminars where conflicts of interest, interest regarding the use of forests are discussed. And I'm quite sure that all of you know a lot about that and the discussion that we are having in the society. And that reflects really KSLA as well, of course. And also, we, as I said before, we have recurring discussions dealing with forest and the climate, of course. These are very important things. So with this, I would like to, again, welcome you to this, this interesting seminar. And I would like to introduce, well, you can introduce yourself, but your name is Peter Berg. So <laughs> thank okay. you very much. <coughs> thank you so much for that uh, introduction to the uh, academies and our topic here this afternoon, Tula and Eva. And also from me, a warm welcome to you all to this joint eva Coesella seminar on the global outlook of the wood products industry in the 2020s. Both to those here at the Wallenberg Auditorium at the uh, Academy uh, of Engineering Sciences and to those streaming uh, this event from somewhere else. This event is recorded uh, and can be viewed at your leisure later as well. My name is Peter Berg, as Eva said. I am a fellow of EVA uh, in its forest technology division. I have the honor of being the moderator here today as a bleak stand-in of Lena Ek, who unfortunately had to change her participation plans at short notice. We have an exciting and, dare I say, star-studded program here today. We will be joined by the chief executives of some of the most important uh, companies on the Swedish and, indeed, global uh, wood products arena. Lars Göran Sandberg of Timwood will set the stage with some observations on the state of the sector. Uh, and then in quick order, the chief executives of Canfor Corporation, Stora Enso's Wood Products Division and Lin Bex will give their perspective on the development of the sector and of their own company's role in it. After a 20 minute coffee break, we will hear from the chief executives of SCA and Södra Skogsägarna ending the speaker series with a reflection from Peter Holmgren uh, on the climate benefits uh, of the forest products industry, I think in general, uh, and wood products in particular. All speakers will have 30 minutes, except for Lars Göran who has a little bit more, uh, including perhaps a couple of minutes at the end for direct questions. We will take questions from the Wallenberg Auditorium uh, only today, not from a web chat. Uh, and to those asking questions, as you ask questions, please use the microphones uh, in the chairs. And, and please do ensure that your questions are indeed questions and not merely statements of opinion. Time permitting, we will bring all speakers back here uh, towards the very end uh, to the stage for a discussion and further questions. One final thing before we start. The security exits from the Wallenberg Auditorium are in that corner, in that corner, and in that corner. So you can go essentially any way you want except in there, then you only go to the technician's area. And in the unlikely event of any emergency, we will reconvene on the street outside of the building. All right, let's go. I am very happy to announce Lars Göran Sandberg as the first speaker. Lars Göran is well known to the global wood products community since decades. He has uh, served the sector as independent advisor for the past 30 years as CEO of Timwood AB and since 2015 as CEO of Timwood Strategic Advisors. His primary focus is on wood products, raw material resources, and bioenergy. Lars Göran, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, my task was to talk about uh, the global wood product supply demand balance and trend in consolidation. And as uh, the intro intro introduction said here, it was uh, uh, a reference made to the happy 20s when we set this out. And happy 20s is certainly what the start was, I think, about the wood products industry. The last couple of years has really been good. Um, and uh, the saying of the Roaring Twenties and Happy Twenties, uh, referring back to the 1920s, uh, 
uh, I did a little bit of research to uh, the global uh, event. How is the global stage uh, uh, in the beginning of the 1920s compared <coughs> to the 2020s? Actually, when you end started the 1920s, you have just ended the First World War, which killed 17 million people in Europe. We ended the Sp Spanish flu, who killed 40 to 50 million people globally. And we had in 1920, 21, hyperinflation in Europe, in Germany, over 100% inflation. So what do we have now in the beginning of the 20th Russian invasion of Ukraine, shattering the European security order, battling the COVID pandemic for the last couple of years, and st starting now sh uh, really increasing interest rates, uh, inflation and so on. Not at all to the same level as we had in the, in the 1920s, but there are some similarities with these decades. So uh, now my task is to, to talk about the wood product sector and how that fits in into the global challenges that we have. But let's first define what is wood products. It is really a very flexible environmentally pr um, pr product that uh, is composed of basically three main sectors, the solid wood sector, the panel sector, and the engineered wood product sector. And what has really been the development of wood product sector over the last two decades? Yeah, first of all, I mean, we have had, um, let's see, there we are. We have had a, a, a growth of every product line. So sawn timber were growing between 2000 and 2020 by 87 million cubic meter. Softwood by 50 million of these 87. But the panel industry increased by 200 million cubic meter in this period. So it's clearly outgrowing the solid wood sector. MDF grew the most during this period. So totally, we had the growth uh, of the sector from 550 million to 825 million cubic meters, so 375 million cubic meters. And the huge change in the geographical composition of the consumption of wood products. Uh, Asia, uh, especially China, uh, was the big engine of this growth from 22 to 47% of the world share, uh, where North America and Europe declined their, their share during this period. So it's huge change in the geographical composition of where wood products is consumed. And all product lines were growing, but panels was growing the most. Before we go into the supply demand balance outlook, I would like to show three slides th th that to me to reflect about the geopolitical and mega trends that I think is uh, impacting all of us. First of all, I mean, we definitely are, are impacted by demographics. We know that the world population are continuing to grow and likely to peak around 2050. We have urbanization that has gone on for a long time. There are some interesting changes there to more of a suburban development. And I think this is also partly driven by, by this uh, COVID development and working from home, that uh, I mean, you can sometimes uh, get the impression that people are leaving Stockholm in large volumes as they're netty, but they are not going far away. Most of them are going to nearby communities. Like, so this is kind of a re regional enhancement in the Mälar Valley, for example, and of commuting distance. So if you are able to maybe work from home a couple of days uh, a week and not go to the office more than, let's say, three days, then, I mean, you can absolutely consider to commuting a little bit longer distance. So suburban tendency is what we see in certain areas. Globalization has been really the name of the game for a long time. Now, I mean, we clearly see need to de-risk the supply chains. We see a de-regionalization de of, uh, of the supply chains for many, uh, many companies and many businesses. I uh, normally take a, a real life example that I think is quite good. The large American furniture and cabinet manufacturer outsourced a lot of high uh, la labor intensive production to China in around the year 2000. Then when the labor costs were high in, in the coastal uh, China, they moved to uh, Vietnam to lower cost. And now in the last six, seven years, they have moved still labor intensive product to Mexico where they have a land border and closer to the home market. But at the same time, a lot of labor, a lot of uh, product lines has been relocated to the US back with highly automated factories, you, very little labor, l using the latest technology, 
automation, robotics and so on. So I think that technology is driving also a relocation of a lot of product production to the back to the home market. <coughs> and then we have also this uh, in income and quality and especially wealth distribution, polarization of wealth distribution. I mean, we have our Elon Musk's, uh, Jeff Bezos and Warren Buffett, but in the, in just linking back to the 1920s, we had John D. Rockefeller with Standard Oil, we had Andrew Carnegie, and we had Cornelius uh, uh, Vanderbilt. I mean, that was the same type of discussion about wealth polarization in the 20s as we have now. Digitalization is one big driver, and sustainability, of course, a very important driver for our industry. Then, I mean, the geopolitical development that we have. I mean, if you're looking at the reordering of global strengths and relationships, the fall of the Berlin Wall was in, the, in November of 1989. Russian invasion of Ukraine happened the 24th of February. 2022, more or less starting, ending the era of global liberalization, tr globalization, opening of trade flows, integration of Eastern uh, European countries into the EU and NATO. So what do we have now? I mean, we have kind of maybe a period of Cold War. We have two totalitarian countries, Russia and China, uh, very aggressive foreign policies, we have Mr. Lukashenko sitting on the back of Putin, Kim Jong-un on the back of Xi Jinping, and uh, they, I think Xi Jinping is carefully watching now what the costs are for Putin to invade Ukraine, but he eagerly is looking at taking in Taiwan into this picture. So the West has so far been unified uh, here at, uh, with the response, NATO, EU, and the democratic states of, of Asia. But let's hope we can stay together. We have uh, Mr. Trump in the background, uh, who has, I think, contributed more than anyone on the polarization of the American society. So, I mean, there are def definitely tensions here within countries in the West. We have also seen that this external threat has led to application of Sweden and Finland into NATO. So we are in, in uncertain territories when it comes to the geopolitical situation. The third and final one is that what I call the, the paradoxes of policies. I think we have a number of, in our sector, for timberlands owners and wood products industry, we have a number of policy proposals that are, that are aiming at limiting the harvest, carbon effects, conservation, proforestation, protection of old growth. We have climate-related <coughs> impact of climate change, insects, wildfire, windstorms. At the same time, we have a lot of policy proposals to stimulate more, building more in wood, lower, lower carbon footprint, and, and so on, the biophilia benefits. So it's, a, it's a really a paradox of conflicting policy proposals that it's not so easy to navigate in. So I think that's another major challenge. So these are some of the more important, I think, pressures that we have outside <coughs> uh, that impacts our industry. Let's now go in and look at the solog, soft or solog supply situation in the world. And if we do a little quick trip around the world here at a very high level, I mean, you can cl clearly say that in, in Europe, we have a, a flattening out to redu reducing fiber base in Central Europe and growth more, more focusing on the North. Russia is, is a huge uh, surplus, but they are shut out from a big part of the market. We have Japan, who is uh, moving to more self-sufficiency, uh, using their own domestic species. China, huge uh, deficit, import needs. That's the same for other uh, high-growth Asian countries as well. Australia, imbalanced, but small. And New Zealand, a very important log supplier in the Asia-Pacific region, but are now at the peak level of their harvesting. We have Canada, who is exporting, but is cutting down uh, their harvests, especially in the West. And we have the U.S. South, who is uh, a U.S. that is importing, but is improving their self-sufficiency in the U.S. South. And we have South America, who is balanced, but shifting more to hardwoods, or hardwood plantations in particular. So if you look at the, at the different geographical places here, uh, in, in, if we start with North America, we have seen a long-term trend of decline in Western Canada, particularly in BC. 
Uh, it peaked around 87 million cubic meter in 2008 and uh, heading down towards 50 here. Uh, and relatively stable in eastern Canada after a decline in the first decade. Pacific Northwest, relatively stable now, had a big hit in the, in the beginning of the 90s with the Spotted Owl uh, initiative from Clinton Gore. And then the growth is definitely in, in the US South. So US South and Russia is the two only areas where there is significant growth opportunities. Europe is now, has been increasing for a number of years, but is reaching sustainable levels now with the spruce bark beetle impact in Central Europe. And we have seen that the export of logs, when normally doesn't happen, has exploded in the last year, which is sanitary har harvests from, from bug-killed wood in, in, in Central. So only Czechia and Germany, they exported around 11 million cubic meters to China last year. So that, that's very, uh, very unusual, that we, but they have been able to buy these logs at an attractive price. Russia is a, a big fiber basket. I mean, we always cut a, a lot lower than, this, than the net, net annual increment because of many reasons, infrastructure, uh, um, too costly to reach certain harvest, uh, la lack of investments, etc., etc. But now, of course, they are uh, shut out of a large part of the world market given the sanctions. New Zealand is a very important log supplier in the Asia-Pacific region. They are at peak levels now. They are really harvesting a lot of what's planted in the 1990s. There, there is a radiata saw log regime here that goes 25 to 30 years. And now they have not planted a lot in the last 20 years. So whatever they plant now, it will not be har harvested until 2050. So we know that there will be a significant uh, decline here in the next five to ten years from, from New Zealand. <coughs> and it's interesting when you look at the European situation. We, our production in Europe has been growing um, quicker than its demand. So we have, in 2020, we exported 20 million cubic meters outside of Europe, primarily to Middle East, North Africa, Asia, and the US. And uh, then if we look forward here, uh, with the decline we are forecasting in Central Europe uh, because of the bug-killed ki bug, uh, timber and the downsizing of the harvest in, in especially Germany and Czechia, we see that the harvest is going down there. And uh, we can just remind ourselves that Germany and Czechia 2020 exported 12 million cubic meter of sawn timber. 12 million cubic meter. That's quite a lot. And if we then add how much is coming from Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine, that's about 10% of the demand. So if you add up Czechia, Germany, and uh, what's come from this area, that's about the total export uh, that Europe had in 2020 outside, outside Europe. So big, uh, big impact. China has, uh, China has added over these last decades, 100 million cubic meter of demand of saw logs. That's equivalent to 50 million cubic meter. On sawn timber, that's, uh, Russia is the largest supplier with 15 million cubic meter. On the log side, New Zealand is uh, one of the biggest, followed by Europe. So what happens now when the Europe will not export if we don't have bug kill tim logs? And what happens when New Zealand then are hitting its peak and has to reduce their harvest significantly? The two major log sources that will be in decline in this area. US uh, uh, or North America, the sawn timber production has been declining basically in all regions over this 20 year period, with the exception of the US South, where the growth really is taking place. That's the big picture. So in 2021, we're heading for a global demand of around 350 million cubic meter, trending upwards going forward. So if we summarize the supply situation, supply demand situation in Europe, we, we think we are heading into a flat to decline in supply of saw logs, driven by the spruce bark beetle outbreak in Germany and Czechia. 
and then it is uh, then uh, exacerbated by by the supply from Russia, lack of supply from Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. Growing demand, we see a growing demand in Europe because of, of climate control emissions, sequester carbon. So the uh, demand is going up, and the supply is flattening to declining. So export capacity from Europe, outside Europe, is quite up for the longer term. In the Asia-Pacific region, increase in deficit as uh, the zone timber demand grows faster than the import of logs. Russia likely, because of this geopolitical development, are moving closer to China, both in terms of logs or lumber. I think they will be quite flexible with their, with their taxes on, on, on logs and so on in, in the internal dealing with, with Russia. North America, if you look at it as a closed system, is more in balance going, going forward uh, with the growth uh, in the U.S. South and the decline of supply from Western Canada. And as I said earlier, the U.S. South is the only region excluding Russia that has the ability to significantly increase the soft or solar harvest. <coughs> so how has the industry responded to this development? The rules of the game are clearly changing. First of all, in North America, there have been a tremendous expansion of Canadian companies into the U.S. South. Now we have about 60, close to 60 sawmills in the U.S. South that produces about 33 million cubic meters that has been basically built up on the, over the last 15 years. So that's a quick, that's a substantial expansion, where of Canfor is one of the largest players. So that's one major pan-North American development. And I think very timely, Canfor, is, who is one of the two largest companies in so solid wood in the world, is the only truly global company today in Lambe with a significant platform in Europe, in Sweden, in the U.S. South and in Western Canada. We know when we look at, uh, at European companies that Stora Enso has been clearly for a long time, a pan-European player for the last 20 years, uh, the first one to become pan-European. But we see now that other companies like Binderholz has expanded. They bought the sawmill of Apo and five years ago in Finland. They are in Latvia. They have acquired Klenk uh, and BSW in UK and Klausner's two sawmills in the US South. So they are come getting into a more of a, of a global footprint. And companies in Central Europe, I think, has been seeing the writing on the walls of fiber shortage in, in Central Europe. So they start to look at acquiring assets in other geographies. So where are they looking? They look more north. Mr. Schweighofer buying one sawmill in Western Finland. We have uh, Meyer Melnoff buying uh, two, three sawmills in middle part of Sweden um, earlier this year, and then the German Siegler company buying two sawmills in, in Sweden here in the spring, just recently. So they clearly, I uh, think, a sign that they see that the fiber problems will be increasing in Central Europe. If we take an example from another product line, like the Oriented Strand Board uh, capacity, there, I mean, it's, e it's even a lot worse because they have put in a lot of investments in Eastern Europe, especially Russia, Belarus, Ukraine. Most of the capacity, greenfield capacity over the last 20 years has been built in that area. So companies like Kronospan, for example, they have 10 factories, uh, 10 greenfield factories that has been built in this area, which un with uncertain value, value I think, it, today. So the large part of the supply capacity on the European side is then uh, under threat. And uh, so, so that has led to record high prices on OSB. And uh, we don't hear much about how they will handle it, but they, I think they are operating still in low speed, uh, but an uncertain future. If we look on the panel side, what has been the big movement in terms of global consolidation and development, I think that there we have a very different scenario. We have had the European model of integrated value adding panel board manufacturing, high quality continuous presses with laminate flooring, uh, various kinds of surface materials, uh, thermofused melamine and laminates and so on. 
that has been established by European leaders in North America, Greenfield, not buying all the capacity, all the assets or so of the older business model, but really brand new. And there are several billion dollars invested here in strategic locations, especially in the US South. And the South American company, uh, Arauco, has followed very much the, the business model of the, of the European players. It is also quite interesting to observe that these family-owned Aust Austrian companies in both the solid wood side and the panel side has been able to grow so much, still very much privately held. These six companies that I have here, they have sales to well over 20 billion euro. Uh, and uh, it's a clear difference between the Sawn Timber and the panel side. The Sawn Timber companies has a relatively low uh, exposure to uh, Eastern Europe, to Russia, to Belarus, to Ukraine, just a few mills. Um, <coughs> and, but if you go to the Kronospan, Peter Kindle, about 10 factories in this area, and significant asset bases also with the uh, Swiss Krono and Egger in that area. So it will be very interesting to see how, how they will handle this and how that will impact their balance sheets and so on and their ability to, to expand in, in North America. Um, going forward here. So very little been announced about them re reducing anything, leaving anything or selling anything. Uh, we haven't heard much about that, but will be interesting to, to follow. So another, another development that we see in our industry is of course the development of more value added products and, and systems. And uh, this is kind of an, <laughs> an attempt just to show the taxonomy of various engine lead wood products. You can say that <coughs> the one, excuse me, the ones that are on the left hand side here are uh, really products that amplify the use of solid wood like CLT and so on. Uh, and in a world of very high cost for uh, veneer logs and saw logs, I think high lumber intensive product will be less competitive with, for example, strand based products and others. So, so this is a consideration. Another thing that was observed now during the last two years when we had such wild pr price swings in more commodity based product like Sawn Timber and OSB is that when you are making commitments to builders or distributors share on engine need wood products, you, you have a much longer commitment on prices and so on. And then when you have input of raw material or has huge price swings and so on, your margin, your margin has been very pressed in, in this business. So that, that, is a, that is a dilemma. But what I believe is that we are, at the we are on track in the building industry, which uses 75% of all wood products. We move, we move from today from components to more elements because, because of you have to increase productivity, efficiency. This is a similar track that we saw 20 years ago in the car industry. Car industry used to have two, 300 component suppliers to the line, the assembly line. Today, I mean, you have a handful of system integrators that gives more assembled, uh, fully assembled uh, components or elements. So this is a development we see. And uh, even if we love wood products and think that's the best solution in the world, it, it is not the best solution for every product application. So that's why we believe in hybrid systems more in the future that you combine wood-based product with other materials into hybrid systems. And this development, I think, will, will continue unabated uh, going forward. So this is something we must, uh, we must follow closely. But it's not uncomplicated, as we saw with the huge uh, bankruptcy of the Caterra company in the US, I think a bankruptcy over two, three billion dollars. So you have to be very careful in the business models you use. Okay, so if we try to summarize this now, and, and if I uh, go into my last two slides here and try to summarize what I do think uh, will happen in the sector, uh, I would say that, that uh, the geopolitical or other events will continue to impact global supply chains and alter trade flows in the world, requiring the need for resiliency, 
to be built into them. Climate change as a global disruptor and wood products can play a very important part of the solution of that with the correct policies. And here I think that there is really the battle of pol the pol policy paradoxes that we have to stay on top of in the industry. That's a very compl complicated landscape to navigate with difficulty to see the whole picture. Uh, we know what the supply is basically. We know how much there is in the ground and we know that demand is going to uh, grow, showing an imbalance, we think, the resource scarcity, likely trans translating into higher prices. Europe tight with very limited surplus to export outside Europe long term. North America imbalanced as a closed system with expansion of US South. Asia Pacific increasing fiber deficit. China turns, turns more to Russia. Uh, in, in this geopolitical world that we are looking at now. The continued industry consolidation will be a prerequisite for distribution channel balance, financial access and customer service, we think. And we think also that the wood products, the part of the forest industry will continue to be more and more important in relative terms as, as part of, of growth pillars in integrated companies. Wood or hybrid based solutions, solution provided will be an evolutionary process for product development and customer acceptance. And uh, we believe also that development of software and other tools and so on are helping this development of system and, and hybrid developments. And to link back then to where I started the 1920s compared to the 2020s, what we definitely don't want to happen as we end the 2020s is a stock market crash a la Wall Street, October 1929, which really was setting up the, the Great Depression of the 1930s and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal programs and so on. So that we hope we will avoid. But if we can do that and if we can manage the geopolitical challenges, the policy policy challenges we have, then I think I am convinced we have a happy uh, 2020s in front of us, both for Timberlands owners and for wood products companies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lars Joram. Mm -hmm. And we do have a couple of minutes for questions, so uh, I'm not going to let you go quite yet. Sure. Um, I can start off a little bit and we'll get more questions from the audience. You had a great many interesting slides on the imbalance between supply and demand, and you mm -hmm. said at the end that prices would rise. But then what? What will yield? Will we see more supply of some sort, or will demand actually decrease? We can't service all demand. What do you think will happen? Well, everything be, will be a relationship of, of how competitive we are against other materials, and so of course, so will be what will be the price, be it the steel or aluminum or other, I mean, the relative. That's a very important, of course, the substitution hmm. development. Um, so by, so I'm, I'm pretty sure we can be competitive if we look at, at, at the competitive of us versus, but again, I'm, I'm not kind of, uh, I'm not uh, radical in the way that I think wood should be used for everything, as I said. I think it, the combination of, of materials is really where I think we should go. Will we see methods developed to cons make construction in hardwoods? That could very well happen, and that we already see. I mean, for example, if you go into strand-based products uh, uh, where you can accept certain load-bearing criteria, then like LSL product, that then you can use Aspen. Hmm. Aspen is the perfect example that you can use. That would, and so you will, of course, seek for more cheaper raw material for certain products. That hmm. if, if the prices are high for softwood logs and lumber, then, of course, you would start to seek for other alternatives. So I, I think so in terms of strand-based product, very much so. Okay. Questions from the audience? Yes, I have one there. Uh, Martin Jaltz from the Austrian Embassy. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. You also mentioned consolidation among the industry, and this is something which has happened probably in the last few years. You mentioned a few examples of Austrian companies acquiring assets. Is this a trend which will continue? Is there, are there any assets left to be acquired, uh, or is there any readiness by others to be bought? I think there is, uh, I mean, our industry is uh, quite fragmented. It's still, compared to many industries, we, we are a long way from being that consolidated as you, if you go to steel industry, aluminum, or other industries, they're much more consolidated than we are on the wood product side. So I, I certainly think so, especially in, in terms of global 
diversification, growth into other areas, then, then of course the consolidation is, is, I think that will continue, absolutely. And, and again, I, as, as you're coming from Austria, I'm, I'm uh, very impressed by, by uh, the country who is uh, not so large like we, the Sweden, but the, the, the ability of these private owned companies is quite impressive. I mean, how they have been able to grow their, their businesses on, a, on a both pan-European and, glo and global scale. Any other thoughts and questions? Not quite warm yet. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned towards the very end um, the, the hybrid structures. Mm -hmm. I, is that so far more a thought and an idea, or do we actually see it happening? Do we see more collaboration between cement companies and, and wood products companies? or uh, yeah, we, we see it, yes, but I think it's more le than with the companies, uh, building companies and so on that I've seen that, that is doing that. I mean, it's not so, so big yet, but uh, I think it is coming. Uh, as we move up that pyramid. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> and after that terrific uh, journey across the, the different elements of the sector, it is a particular honor and pleasure to welcome Don Kane to EVA and, and Stockholm. Uh, Don Kane is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Vancouver based Canfor Corporation since 2011. A company that has been his professional home since 1979. Right? Prior to being appointed the Chief Executive Officer, he spent 10 years as Camfor's Vice President of Sales and Marketing uh, and is one of the lead architects of Asian market development for Canadian forest products. Don's work in growing markets for Camfor's products around the world uh, has provided him with deep connections uh, to global markets and customers. His long list of uh, positions as the director and chair of companies and organizations include the Forest Products Association of Canada, the Council of Forest Industries, and perhaps of particular interest to a Swedish audience, Vida Corporation. So very pleased to have you here, Don. Stage is yours. <laughs> all right. Uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, great, great to see you all uh, this afternoon, uh, every one of you, and it's especially great to be here actually in person. I mean, we've, I think we've all had enough of these uh, Zoom calls and Teams calls and everything else that we've had to do the last couple of years here. So it's great to be here in Stockholm and, and uh, like I say, to be with, with all of you. And I, a couple of things I'd like to, first of all, uh, just uh, start by recognizing the Royal Swedish Academy uh, of Engineering Sciences and the Royal Swedish Academy of Agriculture and Forestry for organi organizing what I think is just a very important seminar on the global wood products industry and really the prospects of, of future growth. So um, th it's also uh, a tremendous opportunity to leverage your members' uh, collective capacity and dialogue about our sector's potential, potential to advance climate smart Low carbon solutions, which Lars talked about a bit as well, uh, in response to some of the challenges that we collectively face uh, worldwide. Uh, my thanks to Tula Thierry, President of the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences, and Eva Pedersen, Academy Secret Secretary General and Managing Director of the Royal Swedish Academy of Agriculture and Forestry for convening us and challenging, challenging us with this question, uh, will this be the golden 20s decade for the wood products uh, industry? So thanks, I also maybe uh, want to thank uh, Lars Gorn Sandberg uh, as well, who's a, a very good friend of mine and, and someone I've respected and worked with for a number of years. Um, and I wanted to thank him for helping to make the connection with uh, several of you in this room uh, and with the academies. I'm honored to be included and to have the opportunity to share Canfor's story and views with such a prominent group of economists, of engineers, uh, educationalists, and decision makers from across Sweden. Uh, Sweden, as most of you probably know, is a significant part of Canfor's business now and a significant contributor, frankly, to our overall success. Uh, our 70% interest in Vita, Canfor's Swedish subsidiary, has allowed us to continue to advance our global uh, diversification. Uh, so today I'll be sharing some perspectives on Canfor, who we are, how, and, <coughs> and where we've been expanding, and our vision, more importantly, for the future. And I'll also share a bit of a view on our funda the fundamental drivers which underpin the defining and critical roles that I am confident forest products will play in the future. 
uh, enabling digital c capabilities such as automation and innovation, robotics, big data and analytics, augmented and virtual realities, uh, and the Internet of Things are anticipated to continually change and advance the forest industry and ensuring our competitiveness, our responsiveness, and our, frankly, our relevance uh, well beyond what we imagine today. Uh, some call this movement the fourth industrial revolution. Others refer to it as the sustainable revolution, which I frankly believe is maybe a more accurate description. Uh, the combination of technology and sustainability is critical as we look into the future. Uh, for the forest products industry, it's game changing and will ensure we are positioned to be at the forefront of this revolution. For those, of, for those of you who are newer to, the, to our story, the Canfor story, uh, maybe I'll start just by telling you a bit about who we are and what we kind of stand for. Uh, Canfor is an integrated global supplier of sustainable forest product solutions and one of the world's largest softwood lumber producers. Our, our vision is, is to be the most innovative and sustainable global resource company, delivering the highest value to our customers. Today, our annual solid wood production capacity is 13 million cubic meters through 38 sawmills. And we have plans to grow to 17 million cubic meters with key operating platforms in Canada, the United States, and Europe. We're headquartered in Vancouver, British Columbia on Canada's west coast. Our annual turnover or annual sales revenue is approximately $8 billion. Our return on capital employed last year was 51% and our overall profit last year was uh, 2.2 billion. All of those numbers were records in 2021. Uh, in total, we have 58 global manufacturing operations, including uh, 38 sawmills, four pulp mills, a paper mill, uh, three pellet mills, two glue lamp facilities, and nine kind of specialty, what we would call specialty facilities. In addition, we have two facilities uh, that produce green energy. We have a pulp innovation center, a tree nursery, and we have a fairly large trucking fleet in uh, South Carolina. And our sales teams market products around the world, and we have offices in, of course, as I mentioned, in Vancouver, in Mobile, Alabama, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and in various operations around the world in Asia and as well as in Europe. Uh, in 2018, we were very excited to announce our 70% acquisition of the Vita Group out of uh, Vexja, Sweden, if I pronounce that right. Uh, we, we've had a long history and relationship with Vita uh, for over 30 years and have always been impressed with, with, with all the folks at Vita and the reputation that they have and the brand that they've developed really uh, worldwide. Uh, Krister uh, Johansson, Mons Johansson, Sante Dahl, who I know a lot of you know here, in our view are some of the best operators and marketers that I've ever come across. Uh, in my career. Uh, we, part we partnered with Vita when they became the first importer of European spruce boards and dimensional lumber into the North American home center market, actually into Home Depot, basically 30 years ago. We knew the, we actually, we knew the quality of their team, we knew their products fairly well, uh, their customer relationships, and most importantly, we, we really understood the value of their brand, as I mentioned, uh, worldwide. We'd been, we'd been pursuing Vita for, for a long time, uh, we, we took three runs at them and failed twice. Uh, we, just, we just couldn't afford it. Um, but we're pleased to have them part of the Canfor team today. Uh, Vita, as many of you do know, it's, it's uh, one of Sweden's largest forest products producers with approximately 1,350 employees. Uh, and they've got 23 production plants, uh, which 12 of those are sawmills. Uh, the, the, uh, the operations are strategically located close to the forest landowners uh, in the countries of Smolen, uh, Skoni, and Bestra Yodaland. Uh, I'm not sure I got that right, but I speak better Mandarin than Swedish. Okay? Um, anyway, Vita, Vita mainly specializes in the production of uh, structural timber for a variety of markets, uh, producing approximately 3 million cubic meters of lumber annually, with about 75% of Vita's sawn wood products being exported to Europe, Asia, or um, Africa, or Australia. Um, in, the, in terms of the Vita operations, they also have <coughs> a housing construction uh, company. Uh, they, have a pack they have some packaging production. They, have, they do animal bedding, pellet production, and of course, they also have some biofuel operations as well. So under, under the leadership of Mons Johansson, who's our uh, CEO of the Vita Group, along with the chairman, uh, Sante Dahl, who I know many of you, uh, many of you know, uh, our, the Canfor's investment in Vita has really helped our company diversify and grow 
uh, our position overall in a global market, something we've been concentrating on for, uh, for quite a while. Uh, in, in 2020, Mons and Sante led the acquisition of three additional sawmills from Berg's Timber, uh, which inc increased the Vita production by about 20% uh, a couple years ago. And so we're, and we think we're kind of well positioned now to uh, grow further with additional investment. Uh, through Vita, we've been able to further diversify our geographic footprint and product mix with the European spruce pine that now accounts for about 20% 20 20 of our uh, Canfor's total production. So just, just real uh, quickly, i uh, asked to talk a little bit about the history here, so I'll keep it brief, but uh, I'll take a step back and tell you about the legacy that has really shaped some of the values of, uh, by which we operate today as Canfor. Our, our roots uh, trace back to 1938 when uh, brothers-in-law John Prentice and Poli Bentley uh, and their families left their native Austria uh, as World War II was just about to begin. When they arrived in Vancouver, they, they quickly started up a wood veneer company and built a small sawmill that employed about 28 people. For tho from those modest beginnings, uh, they quickly started, um, they, they, they quickly became, a, a, well, as a family company, uh, they had a growth mindset and they had that right from the start. And uh, so they basically expanded uh, the operations quite quickly in, in Western Canada. About two years later, they purchased a large sawmill in Vancouver. Uh, which gave them a, an access to a, a, a big export company called Seaboard Lumber Sales and gave us kind of a, an entry into all the overseas markets, which was, which was real critical at that time. Um, they expanded rapidly. They bought timber rights um, across the West uh, ex and expanded their logging division and began producing hardboard panels. 1955 marked the entry into our neighboring province uh, in Western Canada, Alberta, uh, with some sawmill and plywood operations in Grand Prairie, uh, followed by about 20 years of expansion in BC's northern region, which is really was our base for a long time. After a, a fairly significant growth, we became a public company in 1983, and much of this has been through strategic acquisitions of, um, of companies that support our, our vision and our values, and really our customer base, maybe more, most important. Uh, 2006 was the beginning of our global expansion, uh, with entry into the U.S. South through the New South Companies Group based in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And we had basically a steady path of progress, progress since then um, over the last kind of 15 years. So our, our presence in the U.S. South now is, is we have 15 operations now across six states in the South. Uh, in 2016, we opened up our headquarters uh, of our operating company in Mobile, Alabama, and we also diversified our product mix through the purchase of a, a, a very specialized board mill in southern British Columbia uh, called Wendell Box. Um, and then the specialty lumber from our radium on our Elko sawmills, which is in southern British Columbia, uh, we use that uh, for mass timber construction supply uh, for some of the, uh, well, we actually used it for the, to, to create the, at that time the largest and, and tallest uh, uh, wood frame building uh, in the world at that time. So a number of, that's changed a lot today, but this is back a few years back. Uh, this year marks my 43rd year with Canfor, uh, and, my, and my many years with, with uh, the company is not uncommon amongst those who have been part of its success in North America. In fact, Mr. Uh, Peter Bentley, who was a son of one of our founders, uh, all, and, and who also served as CEO of Canfor, uh, retired from our board in 2019 after a tenure of more than 75 years with the company. So before we, we kind of move into <coughs> some discussion here about the opportunities ahead, I'd also like to share some information about our ownership structure because it's maybe a little bit different than some. Um, we're a public, first of all, we're a publicly traded company on the Toronto Stock Exchange uh, with the, and we have the benefit of a long-term majority interest investor, uh, the Jim Pattison Group, um, which owns about 51% of the company's shares. Uh, that uh, Jim Pattison Group is headquartered also in Vancouver, and the private international conglomerate's legacy follows pretty much the same story as Canfor, and today the, the uh, Jimmy's Group uh, has about 51,000 employees and, and had about $13 billion in revenue last year. W if you ask Jimmy, who's the private owner of, of the Pattison Group, um, he, w w when you ask him, he will say that we're in the business of growing the business and we're concentrating on things that are friendly to the environment while constantly innovating and finding ways to make sure we remain sustainable, innovative, and profitable for the long term. 
This growth orientation and focus on total customer satisfaction is ideally suited to the ambitions we have for Can Canfor kind of as a global leader. So we've, we've developed and we're really orc, uh, executing on a strategy of geographic and product diversification. And we're doing that to meet the growing demands of our global customers and really to help us secure a sustainable future for the company. Our growth and, and geographic diversification into the US South Europe and the neighboring province Alberta has really given us access to global markets and the resources, flexibility and reliability to consistently provide our customers with high quality products. By growing our business globally and offering higher value lumber products, we're increasingly able to single, be the single source supplier for some of our key strategic customers and provide more reliable, competitive and sustainable solutions to our customers. In British Columbia, the operating environment, as, as Lars mentioned, has become increasingly challenging. And as a result, we've had to make adjustments uh, to our operating footprint. The fiber supply shortage in British Columbia is a result of the devastating impact of the mountain pine beetle infestation, which has really decimated the forest in British Columbia for basically 20 years. It's estimated that the, that the beetle infestations damaged about 730 million cubic meters of pine that represents approximately 15 years of overall log supply. It's, it's reduced what we call the annual allowable cut in here in northern British Columbia by about 40%. On top of that, the catastrophic uh, wildfires across the province in recent years have further impacted uh, fiber supply in, in the west. And last year was the third largest fire season that we've had on record with about 8,700 square kilometers of forest burned which is in addition to 12,000 square kilometers burned in 2017 and 13,000 kilometers square kilometers burned in 2018. In addition, tim timber harvesting has been limited due to the government decisions to restrict land use and protect certain old growth forested areas and, and particularly boreal, boreal forests. And as a result of all of that, uh, the, forest, the forestry industry in British Columbia is going through a process to really what we would call just right size production capacity to a more sustainable level that aligns frankly with the available fiber supply they're going to have available to deal with. So we made, we've had to make some difficult decisions to shut down some sawmills. Um, but however, as a result of that, um, we're, we're going to be leaner for sure, but we feel we're going to be stronger and we are still very well positioned to supply the growing softwood fiber demand in the Asia Pacific particularly and North America regions. So I, as I noted, Canfor has been working to divide our, uh, diversify our product mix uh, to produce more higher value products and invest in other regions in the world. So earlier this year, we acquired Miller Western's uh, three solid wood operations and associated tenures in Alberta and added through that a significant high value, especially millworks uh, facility. The, the Miller Western acquisition offers us an opportunity for growth in high value SPF lumber, enables vertical integration expansion in support of our key home center customer base and aligns with our product and geographic diversification uh, also. We expect uh, further targeted growth in Alberta that could align uh, our produ production profile with the key customer demand segments. And we also see the US South, particularly the, <coughs> excuse me, the Eastern half as a, uh, as a significant strategic growth opportunity. Uh, since 2013, we've grown our, uh, we've grown by about 300% in the US South through basically through targeted CapEx and strategic acquisitions. We're now investing in a new uh, state-of-the-art sawmill in Louisiana that's scheduled to start up later this year, which will offer additional value-added opportunities uh, for us overall and give us the flexibility to produce a, a wider variety of products than we've been accustomed to in the past. And it, it's our first greenfield project in the United States. Uh, the Derrida, Louisiana plant offers access to a, a, a real abundant supply of high quality fiber in the area, very close to key strategic customers, uh, gives us access to Texas, which is a big market in North America. And then just overall further diversification of our US footprint. We've also announced plans to invest another 130 million to modernize and expand an, another mill that we have in uh, Arkansas. And this project will come into service in the first quarter of 2024 and will again increase our production there for sure. But again, always all focused on the higher value product mix, including laminates and mach uh, machine stress rated products and, and um, cross laminated timber raw material. 
We're committed to having a state-of-the-art top quartile facilities everywhere that we operate and have plans to organically grow our pro portfolio through additional capital investments across all, op all our operations, including VITA. Each, each uh, acquisition and expansion adds new products and new solutions for our customers worldwide. And the, the diversification that I speak to has really allowed us to bring in some unique skills to our organization um, or access to new markets around the globe, including Europe, the Middle East, uh, North Africa, as well as Australia. Uh, in many markets, including here in Europe, uh, we are seeing an evolution in the home center segment. Uh, while the focus has tended to be on the do-it-yourself uh, consumer, more and more home centers are focusing on being a kind of a full solution provider uh, for major builders which is something relatively new, at least it is in North America. Canfor's goal is to be the leading supplier to the global home center uh, customer base, which we think has significant potential for growth. So I, I'd like to just touch on some of Canfor's focus on diversification and, and producing the higher value forest products and what the kind of future looks like. So currently we produce dimension lumber, we produce specialty lumber, engineered wood products, and pulp and paper and, and wood pellets, as I mentioned at the outside, outset. So with climate change uh, worsening, people are reimagining the resources that we use every day through a greener and cleaner lens. And sustainable forest products are an obvious and smart choice, as I think we all agree with. Uh, this is a very exciting time for our industry, uh, frankly, and, and really opens up some unprecedented opportunities for, for both producers and also for our customers. An example is, is of one of the higher value products we produce uh, which is good for the environment, in our view at least, are glue lamp beams, which are a major component uh, of, of uh, mass timber construction. Uh, they offer us many benefits, including, including outperforming steel uh, and concrete in terms of environmental uh, sustainability. With our two facilities in the U.S. South, we are the largest uh, producer of southern yellow pine glue lamp beams and have an overall market share of about 40% of the U.S. Uh, market share uh, currently. I doubt there is, uh, there is, is no one uh, present who is not familiar with these engineered products, but, the, but in case someone needs a, a refresher, mass, mass timber are larger structural panels, post and beams manufactured by using state-of-the-art technology uh, to glue, nail, or dowel wood products together in layers. So we are now seeing mass timber being used more and more in both commercial, residential, and industrial uh, building construction, and specifically in North America. Uh, Europe has been doing that, for, as you all know, for some time. But what makes mass timber so appealing is that it can replace carbon-intensive products such as cement or steel, and it also is lighter than both of those products. And uh, in addition, wood in insulates uh, up to 15 times uh, more effectively than concrete and 400 times more efficiently than, than steel. This gives wood, uh, in our view at least, a distinct advantage as communities around the world promote LEED accredited buildings, which are healthier, highly energy efficient, and much better for our planet overall. As we see an increase in industrialized or modular housing, uh, whereby components are manufactured off-site and transported to the site uh, where the building will be assembled and installed, Mass Timber is making this a more realistic option also in, in an alternative to stick frame housing. Today, the industrialized or module housing, as we call it, is being driven by many jurisdictions around the world who are looking for new and affordable housing options. As with home centers, Canfor's goal is to be a leading supplier to the industrialized housing sector. And another trend we are seeing is a growth in the demand for appearance grade products, which are chosen for their looks and the appeal of living with wood. Uh, products such as fascia, uh, boards, joinery, materials for outdoor living spaces, and, you know, and a few others. Um, but these products, we think, can unlock incremental value in our fiber and provide stable and resilient prices over the demand cycles. As the world continues to move away from fossil-based products and non-renewable resources, we are part of the climate change solution and the circular economy. We see sustainability as an as an opportunity as much as our responsibility. Protecti protecting and nurturing our people, our products, and the planet give us the opportunity to lead and build a strong Canfor for generations to come. Last year, Canfor made the commitment to become a global leader in sustainability with the launch of our comprehensive sustainability strategy. And I just give you, a, I've got a short video I'd like to play uh, for you that kind of gives you a bit of an overview of the commitment that we have to sustainability.
CANFOR is on an ambitious sustainability journey, one that will influence how we work and the impact we have on the communities and planet. We view our efforts like the forest itself. Established practices stand tall. But a strong future requires new growth. So we're building on our track record to forge new paths and become a sustainability leader as a truly global company. Well, sustainability is absolutely critical to the success of Canfor. And it's, and it's not that we haven't been focused on that in the past at all. It's always been a core value and a core focus for the company for several years. It's just that as we look forward, it's getting increasingly more of a focus as we can continue to be more and more concerned about climate change and then at the same time, the role that we can play in mitigating climate change. I'm very proud as a, as a company to have been involved in the advancement of diversity and inclusion to the degree that we have. And the way that we've got our executive group our management group and all the employees at Canfor to have a better understanding. To me, that is, that is going to be a huge indicator of our success for the future. Our strategies are rooted in a respect for the land, a sense of responsibility, our learnings from the past, and our drive for innovation and impact. In the last 20 years, Canfor has planted over a billion trees in Canada, three for every one harvested. In that same time, we have continued to invest in our people, our operations, and our communities to create a company all can be proud of. This renewed focus on sustainability is pivotal for our company right now, uh, of course to ensure our competitive advantage long into the future, but we also want to make sure that we have a positive impact on our people, on our products, and the planet too. This is changing the way we think about our business and incorporating sustainability principles into our overall business strategy to ensure success in the future. Building the tomorrow we imagine possible means creating a future as sustainable as the forests. We plan to demonstrate and achieve commitments to sustainable forestry, climate change, health, safety and wellness, the diversity of our workforce and our relationships with Indigenous peoples. This is good for the planet, good for people, and good for business. Canfor is extremely well positioned um, to benefit here. We have a great employee base that's keen. We have uh, customers that are focused on this issue. Uh, we have our stakeholders, Indigenous groups, governments, communities that are also focused on this issue. So I think we have great alignment and there's a tremendous opportunity for us to differentiate ourselves as a company that's extremely focused on sustainability. It's a huge undertaking and it's going to take a tremendous amount of focus and but what we do recognize is this is a journey it's not going to happen overnight it's going to take some time but we will get there and it, we're, we will get there due to the commitment that we have through all the employees that work at Canfor. Our targets will be met with clear commitments and definitive action plans. We'll work with an expanded spirit of collaboration, talk openly about our strategy and goals, and share our successes and shortcomings so we can learn and understand how to do better. Our industry can make a huge difference on climate change and solutions for the future to make the planet and the world a better place to live. Our commitment begins now. Together we will frame the future. Okay, so as, as the next step uh, in Canfor sustainability journey, we recently announced our commitment uh, to become a net zero carbon company by 2050 through advancing climate positive forest management, uh, producing sustainable forest products and developing impactful partnerships. And uh, to achieve that carbon neutrality, we have developed near term kind of science based targets that include reducing the carbon emissions from pulp and wood products operations by 42% by 2030. So to achieve that 42% reduction, we're, we will be investing about $250 million in carbon abatement projects across the company. Forest products can also contribute to a circular economy and the circular economy is based on three broad principles. One, eliminate waste. Two, keep products and materials in use. And three, regenerate nature. So I'll start with number three. Uh, healthy forests are part of the ecological and natural heritage and in British Columbia, Sweden and the United States, frankly everywhere we operate. In Canada, for every tree that is harvested, three more are planted. It's not, it not only ensures a healthy industry for future decades, but it contributes to the mitigation of climate change. The second principle is a circular economy, is to keep products and material in use 
at their highest value by reusing, remanufacturing, and recycling. Products sourced from forests, such as wood, paper, and packaging, can be recycled, resulting in a lower environmental footprint than comparable materials and can play a larger role in reducing single-use plastics. Forest products are, are reusable, and as we move away from single-use plastics, such as shopping bags and paper, paper is a recyclable and sustainable alternative. And finally, we'll eliminate waste. Uh, as an industry, we should be, and it can for we do, strive to use 100% of each log that we harvest, and almost half of it becomes high-quality lumber uh, that is suited for construction, and about one-third of the log becomes residual wood chips. And these are used for the creation of pulp and paper uh, and panels or pellets, which can be used as a green source of energy in the form of biofuels. The ends that are trimmed off the finished lumber are turned into typically into finger joint lumber, which is an engineered wood product. And the residual waste from harvesting, sawdust, shavings, and bark can be repurposed to generate electricity in the manufacturing process, exported as wood pellets, and now the reality is it can be used to create biofuels and biochemicals. A, pr a project that all of us at CANFOR are really excited about is the development of Arbius Biotech, a pioneering biomass to low-carbon biofuel plant, and it will be co-located at one of our uh, pulp mill sites in Prince George, which is in northern British Columbia. The plant will use innovative, first-of-a-kind technology to convert low-value wood waste and residue into materials used to produce low-carbon biofuels that will have applications primarily in the transportation sector. The, const the construction plan for the plant is pr to proceed initially with one processing line that will convert 25,000 dry metric tons of wood residue to 50,000 barrels of sustainable bio oil per year, a uh, direct substitute for the traditionally produced crude oil product. This project is an example of Canfor's commitment to bioinnovation and thinking differently about what we do. It has the potential to make a significant positive impact on climate change and is a core to Canfor's sustainability journey. Many of, many of us have been talking about this possibility for years. This is no longer theoretical or even experimental. It, it is happening, and the challenge for us really now is, is to make sure that we can make it as economic as possible. Uh, climate change is no longer something that can be ignored or pushed off uh, to the next generation to deal with. We all have a shared responsibility to, to help tackle uh, climate change, and I, we owe it to our shareholders and, our and to our grandchildren to, to really seize this opportunity. To help us achieve that, we are building a bioinnovation team that will unlock the full value of each log by developing and commercializing new opportunities to truly maximize the potential of every single log that we touch. This is the way of the future, and I'm, prou and I'm proud that Canfor is on the leading edge. The other advantage that makes me bullish about our industry is looking forward to the economic potential wood products and wood manufacturing has with respect to future carbon pricing system. Where I am from, uh, British Columbia was one of the first subnational jurisdictions to adopt a carbon tax, but we are decades behind Sweden. So as the rest of the world finally seems to be catching up to Sweden, we believe that the forest products industry is well positioned to use its leverage to our advantage. As a lower carbon building product, we are seeing the very real opportunity of capturing additional market share and additional returns as well. And whether that demand is driven by customers looking to purchase lower carbon products or alternative products being more expensive due to additional or new tax regimes or increased regulatory costs, likely a combination of both, uh, the wood product business is positioned, we think, pretty, uh, pretty well. I'd like to touch briefly on the significant role that technology is having on our industry in, in North America. It's a radically different industry from when I first certainly began my career. Uh, we now rely on <coughs> excuse me, technology to access fiber, to operate our mills, to interact with customers, vendors, and employees, and to report on our business. It's, it's really a digital supply chain now at, from the forest right through to the customer. Traditionally, the supply chain has been a single linear line with limited visibility throughout the supply chain, and certainly there was a lack of access to real-time data. This meant limited ability to adapt to changing business conditions, lack of predictability and forecasting, uh, or ability to accurately forecast. So not anymore. Customers and shareholders are demanding to have more information, they're demanding more transparency, and they're demanding more communication, and frankly, just to have more access. So what does this mean for us as an industry? Well, for Canfor, we are looking at how we will see a more digitally interconnected 
supply network that is significantly more responsive to changing business conditions to allow us to more actively manage our business really around the world. For harvesting, we'll be able to use telematic embedding and logging machinery to capture, report, and analyze machine utilization in real time. Machine sensors will be able to capture log profiles in real time to ensure the right logs get to the right mill at the right time, uh, thereby improving efficiencies and, and overall lowering costs. <coughs> And we can take advantage of drone technology, satellite imagery, LIDAR, LADAR, uh, to monitor forest lands and improve replanting uh, performance. Uh, the, data, the data provided by uh, artificial intelligence is becoming a critical part of mill operations, uh, not only helping us adapt to market conditions quickly, but also helping us with basic functions such as preventing unnecessary downtime due to maintenance and production challenges. Automation continues to evolve in our manufacturing facilities. We are looking at autonomous forklif forklifts, automated yard management and logistics, uh, autonomous logging trucks, and remote operators using smart devices. So our world, frankly, is changing, and not only for, uh, for us as producers of forest products, also for our customers. It will enable us to create differentiated experiences for each of them, designed for their specific and more customized requirements. They'll be able to use self-service portals to order products and track the shipments in real time, and it will allow us to improve our responsiveness to customer needs and changing markets. There is so much more that technology will allow us to do that will make us more efficient and more certainly more sustainable in the, in the long term. Another uh, important area of focus for us is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we, we believe that diverse backgrounds, abilities, experiences, and perspectives make us a much stronger company and our, our goal is to foster a more inclusive and equitable workforce and culture so that we can increase the diversity of our workforce overall. We recognized several years ago that if we were going to take to change the diversity of our organization we need to talk about it with our employees much more and put significant effort into changing our culture to support underrepresented groups. We've established specific goals in areas like leadership representation, inclusive hiring, inclusion and diversity initiatives, uh, in indigenous culture chain training and accelerated leadership programming. We also make it clear that ownership for recognizing and valuing our differences is shared across our organization. It's part of our culture now. We expect all employees to contribute to an inclusive workplace and we provide the tools and training to support them in meeting that expectation. We are also changing how we market ourselves as an employer to intentionally attract a more diverse group of people. All our efforts, of course, are a work in progress, but I'm really proud of the significant strides we've taken along the path to a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive workforce. So in terms of my vision and our vision, really, for Canfor is that we're globally recognized as a company that's, con that's, that's contributing to a better planet. And I believe we can have a, a measurable impact, a material impact on helping to mitigate climate change will move from being more of a production company to a really a solutions-based company that can more meaningfully participate in opportunities like mass timber, bio-innovation, factory-built housing, and customized processes for our global customers. We'll be innovating with low-carbon products that help to tackle climate change. We'll have a digitized supply chain from the forest to the customer. We'll be focused on AI and not just artificial intelligence, but automation and innovation. We'll be looking at robotics, uh, learn technology, and the Internet of Things, as I mentioned, LADAR, 3D printing, and bio-innovation. And we'll be transitioning from a volatile, commodity-based industry in North America, at least, to an industry with predictability, more certainty, and more discipline. We'll be a global leader in sustainability and ESG, uh, environmental, social, and governance performance, uh, developing creative partnerships with our indigenous partners and communities, building an inclusive, equitable, and diverse, work, diverse workforce with a broad and deep pool of talent that provides the skill sets we need for the future. So I'm excited about Canfor's future, how we can continue to evolve as an organization, and the positive impact that we can have on the planet. So thanks again to the Royal Swedish Academy of, of Engineering Sciences and the Royal Swedish Academy of Agriculture and Forestry for convening this discussion, and uh, I look forward to the dialogue uh, the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you very much, Don, for this very interesting expose of uh, the past, current, and future can for sure. uh, I'm sure we'll be able to and have time to come back to many of the questions around sustainability and technology as well in the, in the sure. discussion afterwards. Sure. Maybe just one quick one before we move on in the program. With your investment and your interest in, in Vida in Sweden, what can, beyond the products and the market connections, a Swedish company teach a Canadian company and vice versa? Yeah, well, I, I think when we go into these acquisitions, one of the things we say, and I think has helped make us successful, is we always say right up front, anybody we're talking to, we really believe we can learn as much from you as you can learn from us. And clearly, and, and if you don't go in with that kind of attitude, uh, you know, when, when we do, we, we fail. And so with Vita, it's a perfect example of, uh, we've been really, we've learned a lot from Vita. I think that, uh, I think in the Swedes, I would say, generally speaking, in the industry, they're much more disciplined. The, they're much more, um, uh, we, we have more predictive, we can, we can predict the future a lot better. They seem to be, uh, the, 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 um, the returns that we get are much more flatter. We don't get the spikes like we get in North America and those sorts of things. But, but we've learned an awful lot in, in, uh, from, our, from Vita. And a lot of it, I think, is just the, some of the discipline that you seem to have in Sweden versus uh, some of it in North America. Great. Well, thank you so much. Okay. And from one large company to another large company, um, it is a pleasure to introduce Lars Falkil, who is the Executive Vice President and Head of Store and Sales Division for Wood Products since 2020, and he's based here in Stockholm. Prior to jo uh, joining Storenzo, Lars has more than 20 years of experience in leading positions in companies like Electrolux, Franke, Nobia, EDS 80 Kearney and Ambibox. So he comes in with also a bit of a different perspective into the wood products industry. Lars, please. Good, hey, thanks a lot for having me today. And I have to say, I'm starting on a little bit of a humble note. Um, firstly, I can see so much engineering and research competence. Then I can see industry competence. I mean, Don, when you started working, um, I was only three and a half years old, right? I'm only been now um, with Storenzo for two years, and um, but uh, there's a lot of tailwind I have for this presentation because lots of stuff has already been said. So this presentation is going to focus more on how we actually want to do it, and um, not if we want to do it, but how. And it talks about how the group of Storenzo has to change as a whole, um, and how specifically Wood Products tries to move towards this um, big trend, mainly on construction of bigger buildings, because um, you know the, the trend and the competence around building with wood for s single residential houses is quite um, existing. There's not a lot of a growth opportunity there, but how do we really get that industry, that fragmented and slow construction industry to embrace wooden solutions for multi-story residential buildings, for industrial buildings, commercial buildings, public buildings? Because many of you, um, you know, have been around for some time and we've always been talking about these solutions, but you know, frankly speaking, not that much has changed, right? So I'd like to focus a little bit on how we want to address that. First, let's start with Stora Enso. So um, <laughs> talking about lack of experience, that company has also <laughs> even more experience than I have. It started not in the forestry <coughs> business directly, it started in the mining and the copper um, business uh, more than 700 years ago. Somebody say it's the oldest stock-listed company in the world. So talking about change is something special for Stora Enso. And actually, when we talk about renewables, um, even for Stora Enso, in the grand scheme of things, that has been a quite painful journey. Only in the 70s, we've divested the copper mining part fully. So now the new Stora Enso looks much more like this. Um, the new Stora Enso is much more about packaging, about construction with wood. Um, and I'll come to some of those topics um, before a little bit you know, different to how it looked like 700 years ago. Um, but the one thing that keeps us together is, is really that we're focusing on renewables. We're trying to really focus on the substitution opportunity. What it is that we can replace, um, specifically when it's um, fossil-based. And therefore, the company has changed a lot just in the last two and a half years since um, my boss, Annika Breski, took over, uh, making quite some big changes. One of them is, is that one of the, um, let me see if that works, one of the strongholds of this business for many, many decades, paper, will now be divested. And that is a big change for us because we simply don't see an attractive market opportunity there. Another big change is that us at Wood Products will be focusing much more on those engineered solutions, really on that market um, segment of 
um, commercial industrial buildings. And how we want to do this, this is what I will talk about in a second. So that's why today I'm not going to spend much more time in introducing the Stora Enzo Group, which I hope in Sweden is somewhat known, um, but mo focus much more on how we tackle that change journey now specifically for the wood products part and specifically in the building solutions part for multi-story buildings. The one thing that keeps us together is that at this division, which roughly consists of 4,700 employees and give or take 2 billion euros um, that I'm responsible for, is that we focus on making buildings um, much more low carbon. There is a huge opportunity. And why that is the case, you can see here. So I hope I'm not telling you much new that there is a great um, opportunity to really make an impact on the global climate change. Um, but the truth is we haven't really succeeded much with it as an industry. Um, even though, you know, on average it's a quite simple calculation. So every time we are able to replace one cubic meter of concrete or cement we can, uh, with wood, we can save give or take one full ton of CO2. If we do it for, for steel, we can even save on average two and a half tons of CO2. There's a few things that, you know, are important. I mean, our average footprint as a civilian is, what, 6 to 10 tons, depending on where we live. <laughs> Just a few cubic meters of replacing that will already level out our own performance. If today we would start to build all the roughly 2 billion square meters of building space that is added every year, we could save 500 million tons of CO2 emission, which is more than what the whole of Sweden emits as a whole country. It's not a complicated change. Some of the activities that are driven you know, by policies is not as complicated as replacing concrete and steel with more wood. But yet still, we are not really succeeding. For store ends, so this is a huge opportunity. One of the reasons also, there's various things how we measure our performance. But one of the biggest opportunities is the substitution effect, uh, which I've just talked about before. Um, and that's what the wood product division that I'm responsible for is specifically focusing on. So. We've gone through much change, and in the last decade, our sawmilling capacity has not really grown that much. We have not focused so much on further acquisitions as some have um, in Austria or Kenfo has. We have focused much more on restructuring our existing footprint. So by now, close to half of our sawmilling capacity goes into further processed products, where engineering is a critical challenge, which I'll talk about in a second. We've also had to deal some changes as well. So this year we had to divest two of our Russian mills, um, uh, which puts even more pressure on us to make sure that our foundation is strong, but also that our operations and our developments of value-added engineered solutions is good. And what we do is basically produce these products. Um, and the share of those building solution products is growing. So, um, and these are engineered products, or however you want to call them, Cross-laminated timber, as was said before, is focusing not just on panels, but on those elements which Lars Joran talked about, like walls um, or floors. Um, laminated vinyl lumber or construction beams are really focusing on um, the beams and columns of, um, of um, buildings. And um, um, that is not, in my eyes, already a checkmarked activity. It's not so easy, actually, to produce them at a high quality and an efficient manner. So we have lots of opportunities there still. Greenfield openings have proven to sometimes take much longer across the industry. But I think the even bigger challenge is that the market is not really ready for it. The construction market is not ready. So we have to dare and be open about sharing best practices. In today's, if I may talk about regulation, we've talked about harvesting versus um, wood products before and those two um, challenges that, you know, substitution versus harvesting. 
But there's also another one. Even some of our certifications today measure the wrong way. They look at a building and say, this building has consumed 500 cubic meters of wood. Thus, it's um, replaced or substituted 500 cubic meters of, for instance, concrete. And that gives a certain score. But we should be able to build that building with 400 cubic meters of wood only, with the same um, qualities. And that's something that this industry and even the governments um, are not yet fully optimizing. Um, another thing is that we have to be open-minded to address different types of um, channels within the construction um, value chain. So, and we'll talk about a little bit. Oops, we'll talk a little bit about later. But one is is that for the architects, for the investors, we have to make it really simple to understand how to realize a building um, with very simple without lots of mass timber construction capabilities, tools, and uh, make sure that the load-bearing qualities are fulfilled, that um, you can quickly see what the LCA or the um, environmental performance is, what the price is, what the limitations are, so that you don't have to really become a seasoned 10, 20, 30 years um, veteran in order to build those mass timber buildings, because that is one big challenge. We do not have enough architects, engineering competence in the industry. Another thing is, is that we have to also move much more with what Lars Jordan said from moving from panels, and I'll talk about that in a second, to fully finished products. Support that opportunity for the construction industry towards prefabrication and digitalization. The construction industry as a whole is a quite low profit business. In my previous roles, I learned how to sell washing machines <laughs> that all look the same at different prices. And you don't succeed by just making one washing machine better by uh, reducing the energy consumption by 0.25% or increasing you know, some other. We have to learn how to think like the customer. And I think there's a huge opportunity in the construction industry to address their really painful, low margin, high risk business model. That is also painful for them. So we have to help them, and I'll come to a few examples how we want to do this. But we also have to change our way of working so one thing that for us has changed completely is if you go into this construction business, you're not no longer replenishing some inventory stocks of some customers with um, you know, more or less the same commodity products. You're going into project business. You have to deliver those products in the right order and the perfect quality at the minute at that construction site. If you don't, you're out of the business. That drives complexity. We also have to build partners and knowledge around us. So we have built a um, network of partners, engineering and architects partners, whom we share all our knowledge, all our best practices openly. And I think that's something that we as an industry need to make much more across companies. And the last but not least, we've invested in various tools. I'll give a few examples in a second, because this prefabrication trend and opportunity for the construction industry is not possible without digitization. And then last but not least, we also have to learn how to interact with our customers in a new way. So maybe the old world, oops, maybe the old world of you know, this engineering or um, wood products division has been a lot about the products. And don't get me wrong, I talk about there's huge opportunities still to improve. But we have to learn that this industry will not really succeed unless we are able to win the construction industry, the developers, the investors, the architects, the insurance companies to go that path with us. And that can only succeed if we are open into in that direction as well. Um, now, back to the products a little bit, m you know, <laughs> I'll give you a little bit of an example of how, you know, also the hybrid solutions that was talked about before, how the products evolve and what we're trying to do. So we're moving up the value chain at wood products. It still starts from here to here to a basic commodity product and then engineered products. Today, we're delivering bespoke components just in time to construction sites. But we can add more value here to our products if we can automate and industrialize parts of the process that are today being done manually on site by construction companies. In other words, when we get to here, a bespoke element, we want to add performance enhancing features on an industrial scale like moisture protection, fireproofing, acoustic linings, and connections. We want to respond to the increasing trend towards off-site construction. So if we add these features, then we're decreasing costs for a construction company, solving their labor scarcity problems, and at the same time adding value and improving the quality of our products. 
It differentiates us from our competitors, moves us up the value chain, and allows us to take further market share from competing materials like steel and concrete, supporting our growth strategy. Our long-term vision is to deliver fully finished 2D building elements to the construction industry so that they can, in turn, create low carbon buildings that reduce the impact of climate change for future generations. So just a little side note on the building you've seen, um, as of today still, it's in the uh, world records Guinness book um, um, as the tallest wooden building, one hour north of Oslo, 85 meters tall, 18 stories high. I will be so happy if that is beaten soon because that is, you know, the trend. But the fun thing about hybrid solutions is actually we had to add some concrete slabs on the top floors because the building overall would be too light and would be moving too much with the Oslo winds. Um, so that's my, um, you know, interpretation of where hybrid solutions can make sense. Um, but I think as a company, w this is not an easy path. And even as an industry, because if you talk about efficiency, and, um, and, and also um, years, decades of experience. This cubic meter focus we've had has been optimized to a certain degree. And I'll talk about the opportunities we still have there later on. But to move away into further, not only some cutouts for windows and doors, but also adding insulation, adding wiring, adding um, facades, that to a large degree today cannot be automated because the construction industry, the architect, sadly enough is not automating, uh, sorry, standardizing. So, and then this is like this chicken and egg discussion, uh, which for instance, Katera and others have already painfully understood. You can't assume that the construction industry will move completely to a standardized solution. So we have to take you know, care of that customization requirement. And how to do this is exactly the balance, right? And as a industrial company like Storer Enso, we are doing this step by step. So whatever we can industrialize and automate, that's what we focus on. But we don't go too far too quick in order to then have a fully industrialized automated product that in the end nobody wants. And that balance is, is exactly where the industry in Myers is in at that moment in time. What we're also doing is we are expanding our view much more from our construction partners. So in, in the moment, most of our inputs I get is from engineering partners or construction cu customers. Oh, this would be great if you could offer this solution. But we have to expand our view. One is what I've already mentioned for architects to make it simple, how to plan a building for mass timber, even if that architect has no experience in it. Same goes for investors. Many investors are risk averse. Oh, there's a fire protection risk. There is, I've never done this before, right? Uh, you know, how long is that building gonna hold up and whatnot? So we have to make it simple for them to work. And I'll show you an example in a second. We have to work with the construction in industry to help them address the issue for um, um, prefabrication. We have to work even further in the operational life cycle of a building. For instance, not only to provide all the digital twin data to the operators of a system so that when the building is maintained, is worked on, that everybody knows what product um, you know, uh, qualities are, where can I drill a hole in that wall, right, without hitting a wire. Um, and then last but not least, further expand our view to the full reuse and recyclability of a building. Can it be changed to another purpose? Can an office building be used as a home for, el um, for elderly? Can um, we recycle um, CLT panels because of the glue we use? So we are also investing a lot as a group into um, non-fossil based glue um, logic so that it can also be easier uh, reused and not just burned, but it can also be delaminated so we can actually reconstruct the cutouts of the doors or the windows today and build new panels straight away. So the raw material efficiency is a huge opportunity here as well. Let me give you two concrete examples on the solutions we're working on. One is um, the generative design um, configurator. So this is in a nutshell the opportunity to plan a mass timber building within five minutes instead of five weeks as it is done today for a normal hybrid or concrete steel building. So the architect or the investor can basically take the layout, can say, look, this is the space I want, this is the floor design I want, this is um, the number of stores I want, this is the layout of, um, I want within five minutes can have a really 90% ready design that is built on our best practices for connectors, for load stability, um, for um, um, environmental um, standards, so you can get LCA um, um, out in a second. You can um, also see what the average, cons what the exact consumption of would be, so you get a price tag to it. 
And you can also see, for instance, what are the limitations in terms of designs, right? And you see there's not that many limitations. Today, one of the biggest problems in this industry is that most of the time, mass timber companies are only getting involved when the initial design has already been completed. And then we're competing against concrete cubic meter price, <laughs> and that's a battle we don't want to win because they are not run in a sustainable way. We will not make any compromises on sustainable forest management, so we have to find a way to increase the change and the competence in the initial designing of a phase, and that's what this tool hopefully can contribute. Another solution for the later part of the process of a building is how to manage a huge challenge, which is moisture. So most of, you know, when I joined this industry, I thought the biggest issue is fire. And still, when it comes to regulations, sadly enough it is. But in my humble, low experience, <laughs> moisture is a real big challenge. So here's sensor technology, and how to use that data is a huge um, opportunity for us not just for the transportation of our um, walls and floors, not just for the construction phase, but also for the operation of a building. To early on identify moisture risks and use those algorithms that we have, use that sensor technology that we can provide to make sure that also the tenants, the operators, the developers, the owners of the building have a benefit of li um, living and working in wood. Um, because there's one thing we very rarely talk about, it was just one word in your presentation, biophilic benefits. So it's not just about the climate change, it's not just about the commercial financial benefits we can um, provide here, but it is also true that working and living in a wooden building, especially if it's visual, really improves um, your productivity and your well-being, right? And that is a price premium you can ask from tenants today already. And these type of solutions then reduce the risk levels, right? And then together with this, I believe with this type of technologies, with this type of research, we can really make a change, not just in the early part of the process, but in the later one. So I've talked now a lot about building solutions. I hope I didn't bore you. So for the ones who have a jet lag, I hope you can slowly wake up again. Um, I think the opportunity for us is not just in the building solutions part, but more so also um, in the actual sawmilling. So I came from different industries. And frankly speaking, the first time I saw a sawmill, I was really godsmacked about the manual high share of work the unsafe conditions that many of our um, operators, not just as store ends, I think as an industry, are, um, are in. So there's a huge opportunity also from an engineering research point of view to continue that journey of, as um, th you, know, you were saying basically, is it AI, also automation and innovation, right? And that is, I couldn't agree more. So I think um, 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 here we have still um, a long way to go, working with organic products, which makes it diff different to um, you know my old industries where yeah, washing machines and others were not um, um, as unpredictable as this material. But there is a huge opportunity to make our operations also in the foundation part of our business more safe and much more efficient and also much more efficient when it comes to raw material use. Um, today at Stora Enso and many others, we don't let any part of the locks go waste to waste. But I think we have a huge opportunity to increase the share towards long-lived products more. And that um, focus is also you know, something that I think the governments and the regulations will ask for, rightly so. And that also makes financial sense because we can make a much better profit on long-lived products than on the residuals. So in a nutshell, and that's my last slide, there is huge opportunities for Stora Enso to transform further. So not just the Stora Enso group after 700 years had to transform, but we as a wood products division within, and I think we as an industry. So we have to always think out of the eyes from the customer beyond our own production part. We have to think about why is wood, as you said before, as a substitution product, more valuable than concrete and steel, and not just play the sustainability card. We, have to do, we can only do this if we focus more on supporting the construction industry with their biggest pain, which today, if I may say so, is not just the sustainability performance, but also their low profitability. And there is a huge opportunity if we move towards prefabrication and digitalization. So as an industry, we have to share that part. And then last but not least, in our cooperations, in our 18 mills, and now two less with Russia out, 16 sawmills, so much less than Kenfor, still we have a huge opportunity to also improve not just automation, but also um, how well we use our raw materials um, towards long-lived products. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Lars. That was very interesting. I'll open up the floor for one or two questions in, in, in a moment. But something that intrigues me very much, the journey that you're describing, right? 
must also mean a huge transformation in terms of culture and skill sets from Stora Enzo. How do you sort of the definition of operational excellence that you mentioned, the definition yeah. of even quality must be changing. Yeah. How yeah. do you approach that? Yeah, so in a nutshell, we are we still have 70% of our business in the you know, foundation business, which is very much process and efficiency driven. Now that growth and building solutions project business. Mm. Project business is not much like by <laughs> sawmillers, right? It, it creates complexity and it creates you know, risks and liability. So um, one way how we've um, done it is number one, we've taken an organizational approach to it to you know, um, um, protect that building solutions team. Um, so that they can focus on it. Secondly, we have also counter-cyclically invested into it. So in the last two years, I guess it's no big secret, it was quite profitable to be in that foundation <laughs> business, in, in the classic sound business, right? But we have not stopped our investments into the building solutions um, business for the long run, right? And I think that's what, in the end, really matters, that you mm -hmm. show, you don't just, you know, put this up on a PowerPoint and then say, okay, fine, you know, now we make much more money with another part of the business and you just abandon it but that you continue to invest also when the market goes up the other way around. I think that's how many in our company have seen, also our customers seen, we're in there for the long run. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? You know, when I look at this uh, enormous development that you're undergoing, and also in the previous case, it comes to my mind that you mentioned the, the lack of engineers and lack of architects and so forth. When I'm looking at you know these uh, hybrid materials that need to be developed or or the kind of elements that need to be built, you know, is the public sector, is the educational sector, is research, is it responding quick enough mm. for the needs that you have in order to be able to make this transition? Hmm. Um. Humbly, I'd like to also turn that question back to you because you probably know the answer better than I do. But um, in a nutshell, I think there is two challenges as I see it. The first one is, is that many students, many in, in the research environment still don't see this as a attractive enough, interesting enough business, right? So uh, we need to become, you know, I don't think that many, you know, when you talk about wood products, even outside of, the, maybe outside of this room, certainly outside of this room, would think more beyond sawmilling, right? that you know, we have a much bigger challenge ahead of us, right? That we have to also digitize, that we have to add value, right? We have to look for hybrid solutions. We have to have engineering these statical um, um, competence, right? So I think there's firstly a lack of interest, maybe a lack of understanding how big that opportunity is, and also how much of an opportunity there are to make a positive climate change. And the second thing is, I fully agree with you also. I, s I, I mean, my th these two years have been quite eye-opening for me to see how regulations and how um, um, governments are responding to it because number one there are still many countries I'll give you one example we'll inaugurate our fourth CLT mill in two and a half three months in Czech Republic it's built out of concrete because the government didn't let us build it with wood like the one we have here in Sweden right so um, there is not always a lot of government support on this. There is a lot of lip service, and you know, I call this the PowerPoint commitments, and then in the reality, th we still have some way to go also to support funding of um, research, funding of um, the education sector, but also supporting real regulative change in the detail. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. And one company that has the experience in the long time back with those tricky, you know, the, the component parts, if you wish, is of course Lindex. And we're very pleased to have Stefan Lindex here with us today. He is the fourth generation owner of Lindex Group and reportedly you know, working on ensuring that the fifth generation can take over. And with a Master of Science in Civil Engineering, Stefan was president of Lindex Bug between 2011 and 2019 when he took over as president and chief executive officer of Lindex Group. And under his uh, helm as president of the Index Big, they, they also added the second housing factory and uh, inaugurated that. So without further ado, Stefan, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. There we are. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I will not make uh, uh, 
that's good presentation of the invitation as we heard from you so thank you very much i will copy it so we save some time <coughs> uh, i'm happy to be here and i will talk a little bit about a uh, small piece about our company and uh, some things that we have learned past uh, over the years uh, our company is, uh, when uh, EVA started, uh, it took us five years to, to enter the market. So we started in 1924, so we're not, not uh, that old as all the Stora and so, but uh, we, uh, we are about 100 years old now. Uh, and we started as a sawmill, and uh, my great-grandfather great uh, worked as uh, uh, driving that sawmill, and uh, got kids and they grew up and took over the company and uh, diverse and uh, changed in two different businesses. One uh, took over the sawmill and one started to build things. So uh, after Second World War, uh, the company started to grow a little bit more like uh, being a building uh, contractor uh, service uh, the local region. And uh, Back in 1994, uh, when the European Union uh, entered Sweden, or Sweden entered the European Union, uh, we got changes in the building codes that made it possible to build uh, wood story building, uh, more than two story building with wood framing. And uh, that was uh, the, the key to success for our company. And it was very important to, to enter the European Union, to, to let go of old uh, building codes. So. Uh, so th there was the city fires in, in the late 800 uh, that made it, uh, that stopped building uh, houses higher than two stories. So after that we, we grew and we had um, good reasons to uh, understand that we needed to take another step. And that step was to um, uh, increase the capacity for, for building uh, of houses. And uh, the thing that we produce is uh, uh, uh we have uh, factories producing modules that we assemble on building sites. And uh, uh, the products that we produce is uh, housing or residential. So it can be uh, housing for elderly care, it can be re uh, rental apartments, condominiums, uh, uh, even hotels or student apartments. Uh, but it, it, uh, it we don't uh, produce any uh, commercial areas, uh, only uh, houses for living. And we do them between two and eight story buildings. And we also, um, we have a one stop shop. So we, we, uh, we sell the projects to the, to the consumer or the, the project developer and we produce it uh, in the factory and we also assemble it on the building site. So we have the whole, the whole package. Uh, so we don't use, you know, no, uh, just do the building in, in the factory, we also produce it on site. Um, so in the end, I will show some, some of the projects that we have done, but uh, I will also show you a little bit uh, of, of the factory that we have inaugurated just uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, the we uh, painted up ourselves an image about why, why hasn't the building industry come any longer? Uh, what's the reason for not copying uh, methods that the automotive industry learned for many, many decades ago? I mean, if you would turn the thing on the other way, do, do you see any car manufacturing produce cars on the parking lots? Uh, it's not that common. Uh, and it's, not, uh, it's easy to understand why, uh, but in the building industry, uh, we still work in the same way, uh, mostly of us, because the, the building industry is a, is a standardized industrial uh, process with uh, standardized um, uh, methods. So you can buy, you can start a building company very easy. You, you can rent some uh, machinery and can you can buy lumber and hire some technicians and some, and then you're up and running. Uh, if you build the car industry, car or, uh, automotive industry, you invest huge amount of money in system. So you can be sure that people come back to work uh, with a better attitude than the day before and so on. So we, we decided to to take that step. Uh, and, uh, in 2015, we decided and we turned it on in 2017 in the end. And uh, so I uh, will have a short video of this uh, factory. Hi, I'm Henrik and 
this is our factory. We are an industrial building company using wood from the northern forest, creating apartment buildings in Europe's most modern production facility. In a weather protected environment, the volumes are built step by step along our preparation station and our main production line. Our building system can fill many different needs. We build everything from student housing, rent control departments to condominiums and retirement homes. We offer a full service solution where we take responsibility for the entire process. This means secured in terms of price, product and delivery times. Along the wall line, the exterior walls are put together. Here, we assemble windows, bolt, insulate and paint. When a wall is ready, it proceeds to the main production line for assembly. In parallel, the partitions are built and roofed. Just as the exterior walls, they are fully finished when they are assembled. The main production flow begins with the construction of the floor structure. Then our composite bathroom is put in place and partitions are applied, as well as exterior walls and ceilings. The main production flow begins with the construction of our floor structure. Then our composite bathroom is put in place and partitions are applied, as well as exterior walls and ceilings. When all elements are put together, we install the kitchen and apply the floor surface layers and complete with plumbing. After that, we review the volume to ensure quality. In the last step, the module is sent to the automated warehouse. Here it's collected by an autonomous robot that loaded on the trucks. All that's left is delivering to the construction sites. Thanks to industrial construction, we manage resources efficiently and build climate and cost efficient with high security. We build industrial because we believe in creating homes for more people. We build industrial because we believe in living for more. We build industrial because we believe in living for the many. His voice is a little bit uh, dark and so on, but it's it's not that uh, dangerous. But he uh, he says some things that he, that's important, and that um, how how do you do a change in a, in an industry that is so uh, mature? And uh, we we decided to take this uh, chance and uh, to take a step. So it it costed us a lot of money, and uh, we uh, uh, are struggling with. Uh, getting back into to uh, 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 a good uh, better revenue but if you do an investment normally you can't grow so quick and still have good revenues so now we're getting back the revenues and it feels very very good uh, the factory itself is covered by solar panels so we can uh, harvest sunlight so we can have energy and uh, we we can uh, produce about 35 percent of the needs uh, by using the solar elements and we also have a factory beside us that's ha that has excess heat from manufacturing uh, tall diesel uh, that they use uh, tall oil from uh, the pulp uh, uh, factories. The production is very lean based, so we, we uh, work very much with the continuous improvements and that's important for us uh, in order to grow and still have the, the, the quality that we need. And the environment is very dry. Uh, you don't uh, need to think about the, f the weather when you go to work. Uh, uh, how does it look, uh, the future of, of this, um, the way we produce the housing? We've heard earlier today about um, a little bit about market shares. And uh, you can see there that about 20% of the market share for residential building is, is made from wood wood uh, industrial built housing but and the rest is about uh, from steel and, and uh, concrete and uh, it has changed over the years uh, uh, the thing that we is very proud of is that we where the market share is growing for the uh, building industry that made uh, houses from wood and it's important to to remember that this is quite uh, uh uh, youth. We, we, we have just worked with 20 years in this. It's, it's not very super mature and the customer isn't that familiar yet with they are familiar with the houses but they're not that familiar with the process of buying the apartments. So we are working very much with trying to teach the customers the pros and cons. Uh, for example if you 
order a house, you can change things after the train has left. And that's very, in the backbone as an entrepreneur, you ha can't say no, really. If somebody says, I want to make a late change, no, no, yes, no, you will say yes normally, but you have to say no, because when the train has left, it has left. In the automotive industry, if you decide to order a new car or a vehicle or something, and you decide to, oh, I should have heat the steering wheel, I, I call the, and they say, uh, nicht möglich, auf Wiedersehen. And, uh, and uh, in the building industry, we say, yes, we can change. And it costs a lot. And uh, many of the building organizations today live on that change. But how efficient is that for the end user? Will the price get lower? No, it will always increase. So we try to teach the customers to, to um, see the benefits in, in um, be, be quite strict in, in the planning phase. So we put a lot of energy in training customers. So repeating customers, they understand this. But the first customers, they normally say, that we heard of that before, that the building industry is uh, uh, following the timeline, it's very important, this and that, but uh, it's, our own bus it's our own fault. We need to be better ourselves. Uh, we talk about the carbon footprint. Uh, we know that about 20% of the emissions uh, in, in Sweden comes from building industry. And uh, we want to do a, a little bit change of that. So if you choose to produce from wood, you lower it by about 50%. And if you take in consideration also the, the carbon sink, you will lower it even more. Uh, we're not positive yet, but we are on the verge to reaching the position where we can say we have a positive footprint if you buy a, hu buy a house from wood. One step forward to that is uh, that uh, the government in Sweden has set out some uh, emission that we will, in 2027, we will uh, declare and also have uh, uh, limits in, in how, how much uh, carbon footprint the houses are allowed to, to get. So now we have a five-year period where all the building permits that is uh, granted after 1st of January this year uh, the old buildings are supposed to declare how much they uh, leave from, from the building. So we are very positive to this and wishes <coughs> that this uh, five-year period is used to, to train and to talk with each other. That it's very important that the different stakeholders in this industry s talks to each other so we get uh, a, a 2027 um, building codes that is functional, that it, it's not a political thing that we, we can maneuver around it. We need to make a, a smaller footprint and in, in order to make that we need to collaborate to, to take that further on. So we, we are very, very positive about it. Uh, if we talk about the wish list and uh, we want the, the figures to be absolute figures, not percentile changes. Because if you are worst in the class and you lower 20%, not much has happened. So we want to be very specific uh, with the numbers. And also we want to include the carbon, foot, the carbon sink as part of, of the figures, uh, or at least to have it as an information. So supplier driven, if, if, the, if the customers can make a choice in how much footprint I would like to make with my building, I would like to have the figures in front of me and also use as uh, the specific EPDs uh, to avoid the generic values. Uh, uh, one th thing uh, that we, I mean, we are quite good as we are, but we always need to improve. And one thing is to uh, change to cellulose insulation in our buildings. Today we use primarily stone and uh, glass wool. Uh, and if we can change this uh, insulation material to cellulose. Uh, that would be a very, very efficient way to reduce the footprint. Uh, there are methods today that are uh, not 
very well known, but they are uh, loose wool, uh, cellulose from paper waste, from, uh, from uh, um, newspapers that are grinded and um, treated in special ways. So we have the, the same um, capacity as the normal or the traditional insulation systems, but you can make it in a very, very much more industrialized way. You don't need to touch it. You can have it blown in cistern, um, big um, storages, and you don't need to touch it uh, even if when you produce the walls. You have special machinery to apply it, and uh, it will um, avoid, avoid leakages and uh, small uh, pockets with air. So it will be uh, much better efficiency than, than we have, have today. And uh, if we compare it to today, we would uh, the footprint would be 22 times lower than if you would use the material we have today. And then somebody says, hey, why don't you do it yet? And uh, we are trying, but as we when you are in, a, in a innovation and you collaborate with the companies, you need to take certain steps uh, in, in a slower pace because investing of course it's money, but it's also a uh, way of treating uh, ho how to develop new methods. Uh, you want, don't want to change so much I in one uh, step, so we need to take it in small steps. Uh, in the end, uh, you will have a coffee break in a minute, uh, but I will show some projects that we have done. So we don't think I it's a building industrial is, is not too much to do with stopping architects from uh, thinking. Uh, it has more about using the toolbox clever. Uh, so here, for example, we have uh, 10 story buildings uh, that we built. Uh, if somebody says, I said eight stories, but we are trying a little bit with something. So we own these projects ourselves. So we try to develop methods. Uh, we don't uh, put the, the, the testing on, on the other customers, we test for ourselves. So this project we own ourselves. And uh, you have heard about the moving of Kiruna and Gällivare in northern part of Sweden. So we have a very much projects going on in both Kiruna and Gällivare region. So many projects happening there. And also in uh, Mälardal and we grow a uh, lot of business here. So they, are, uh, they can look uh, in a very different uh, way. We also have developed a way of producing balconies. So they are they look like a concrete balcony, it's but it's made from solid wood. Uh, so it's uh, the feeling is the same as usually, but it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, uh, so they are buildings that we have done over the past. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Stefan. Very interesting to see. Um, you talked about 20% wooden buildings and or apartments and 80% mm -hmm. concrete apartments. How do we switch that relationship around? W what's the critical things to change? I think you mentioned the education of buyers and you were looking forward to this climate declaration. Is there anything mm -hmm. else that needs to be there? Uh, I think the, the, the courage to take the next step. Uh, I mean, I had a very good presentation from Stor Enso uh, before me, and they understand that they need to move their uh, position in the, in the industry. Uh, be prepared to, I mean, usually we had sawmills, when they supplied us uh, years ago, they were happy if we can they could deliver in the right week mm. with the supply. Today we have sawmills that are cutting, they are drilling, they are packaging, they are treating things, they are assembly things for us. So we want to reduce work in our uh, factory mm. and, and buy uh, components. And if you start to collaborate, this figure of 20 will increase to 25. To but it needs to be 21 first before it can <laughs> get 25. So just start working with each other. And also when you talk about climate uh, declaration and 2027, to talk with the policymakers so we do this for real. It's not just a, a figure in the paper mm. uh, because it's a, it's a huge change, change we're doing and we need to have a big respect. So somebody has to be grown in the room to so we can uh, work together. 
So avoiding the power point commitments that Lars talked about, right? Mm. And lower the guards. Yep, very good. Tricky. Questions? It's a coffee break, you know? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I won't let them go yet anyway, so. <laughs> no questions? Let me, let me try another one while you think you sort of uh, of some other questions. Lindex is, after all, a medium-sized construction company. It seems to me that the really big ones have mm. been a bit tentative and not really getting in here mm. in the wood construction yet. Do you think that will be changing? I hope so. <laughs> uh, really, I, I mean, uh, of course we get uh, competitors, but uh, if you don't have competitive uh, co uh, co competitors around you, how will you get better yourself then? Uh, and why have they hesitated, do you think? Because it's a huge step to take. There are two mm. things. First, they have to enter a completely new market, mm. a house. It's not a log. It's a big difference. Mm. And the second is that uh, uh, it's a quite a, uh, another technique. T to, build a, to build a house, it consists of so many details that you will need to... You're responsible for them for about 100 years mm. as, a, as a contractor. Even if you have the, the five, on five plus five years of warranty time, yeah. but the brand will live forever. If you do a good job, the brand will nurture and, and uh, you will be able to grow. And to take the step into a new market and show this brand for the world audience and say, we will do this. And if you fail, two speakers here have talked about Katera mm. as a reference object. Mm. And of course, it's sorry for what happened, but things has happened in Katera factory now. Things are happening. So, but you need to do, uh, you need to take this step, mm. but maybe you can do it in a smaller step than yeah. Every journey starts with the first step, as yeah. they say. Any final question before we break? There you have. Sorry, I might have another one. Uh, you, were, you were talking about different skill set it needs, obviously. Uh, do you find uh, skilled labor in the labor market, or is all your training in-house? Uh, it, it's uh, the the answer is uh, is two. Yes and no. Uh, uh, yes, we can uh, train uh, in-house a lot, uh, of course. So we have a clear clear path for those who are interested in growing the company. But we need to import uh, skills that we not can't grow ourselves. And that is uh, tricky. Uh, it's not super easy, really. Uh, what we can do, uh, what we do is uh, to attract uh, parts of the um, uh, world citizens that normally flip the pages when you see a building company. And it's, uh, it's like to work with inclu including and we have put a lot of energy in finding female workers. And um, by addressing that and putting other glasses on the management to understand uh, why have the female audience skipped us, one didn't in understand that. And we have a lot of, um, we have moved from 11 to 21 percent female workers in the factory. And that is because the leadership as I understand why the uh, population with a, with a bigger brain <laughs> are entering now. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, our next speaker, Ulf Larsson. He's the president and chief executive officer of Svenska Cellerosaxibolaget SCA since 2017, when the company split from its hygiene products part. His three decades in the company uh, also includes being president of SEA Forest Products and president of SEA Timber. And Ulf is also the current chairman of the Swedish Forest Industry Federation, Skogsindustrierna. Without further ado, Ulf, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to say a few words about the SEA, but also the role of wood products within the SEA group. And I'd like to start by giving you a short overview of the company, because I think that also will give you the conditions for wood products within the group. Starting on the left-hand side and starting with the forest, it is the forest within SEA that is the unique resource. And around this forest, we have built up an entire uh, industrial ecosystem. We have 2.6 million hectares of forest land in the company, and by that we are the biggest private forest owner in Europe. Uh, we uh, harvest approximately 50% of what we need in our own industry, 
from our own forests and uh, all our forest holdings are certified according to the FSE and PFC standard. If we then uh, walk into the ecosystem, starting with renewable energy, we are focused in three areas. Wind, we have 20% of installed capacity of wind power on SCA land. We do a lot of things in bioenergy. We produce 12 terawatt hours and, and the main part of that we use in our own industry, but we also sell a lot of pellets externally and we also, I mean, we supply district heating systems with steam and hot water and things like that. And uh, last but not least, we have a lot of ongoing projects in the liquid biofuels. And just now we are performing a rather big project together with SD1, which is a strategic partner with us. So we are uh, in Gothenburg building up a biorefinery, uh, producing 200,000 cubic meters of uh, liquid biofuels. And the startup will be in the beginning of next year. Uh, in wood, I will talk uh, somewhat more about wood, but we produce 2.3 million cubic meters of wood. Uh, by that, we are among the bigger uh, producer of wood in Europe, but still we have no more than maybe 2-3% of the total consumption in Europe. So this is a very fragmented market. In uh, pulp, uh, we produce 900,000 tons of NBSK, Northern Wheat Softwood Craft, in the biggest craft line, uh, biggest uh, pulp mill in the world in softwood. And in addition, we are just now erecting a new uh, CTMP line, half chemical pulp that will be up and running in the beginning of next year. So all in all, 1.2 million ton. <coughs> if we then walk over to uh, uh, container board, uh, already today we are the biggest independent supplier of craft liner to the European market. And by independent, I mean that we have no conversion to boxes uh, in-house. Uh, we are also in uh, that business area performing a rather big project. We are spending 8 billion sec in Obola in order to build up the biggest craft liner mill in the world, producing 725,000 tons. Startup will be in the beginning of next year. So all in all, the total capacity in craft liner will be approximately 1.2 million tons after, after the startup. And last but not least, we have a logistic company, and uh, not the least, we are very happy to have that today, due to the war and, and all disturbances in, the, uh, in all logistical systems. This is a great asset, and has so been also in the, in the past. So, if we then move over to the right-hand side, we have some KPIs. Uh, after the closure of the publication paper business, that we did back in 2020. We had a turnover of slightly less than 20 billion SEC uh, last year, a um, healthy EBITDA margin of close to 50%, and by that an um, industrial return on capital employed of a little bit more than 33, 30%. Uh, in addition to that, we also uh, are a rather big uh, contributor of uh, climate benefit, and. Uh, the figure for 2021 was 10.5 million tons, and uh, it is uh, split between what we are doing in the forest, the net carbon capacity that we have um, in our uh, carbon binding carbon capacity that we have in our forest, that is approximately 5 million tons, and then we have a substitution effect that gives approximately as much. And I will come back to that calculation, and I have seen it also from uh, um, the presentations before, but this is, of course, important for, for us and for the business as such. Just to give you a view of where we are, we have the main part of our forest holdings uh, located in the northern part of Sweden. Uh, we cover 6% of the area of Sweden, 9% of the forest-covered area. Uh, to the right hand side you can see that we also have some uh, forests in, in the Baltics and we have an ongoing program in order to buy 100,000 hectares in five years and we have done approximately 60% out of that up till today. As you can see we have 260 million cubic meters standing volume on our land and if we compare that with what we had in the mid 50s this is approximately 70% more than we had at that time, and still annually we harvest more than double as much as we did at that time. So that is a fantastic story. 
of course. So, as I said, uh, the forest is the unique resource within SEA, and it represents approximately 70% of the value of the company. And uh, wood products, they are crucial in order to maintain and to increase that value, and I will come back to that also. Maybe it is to bang in an open door, but anyway, I think uh, it might be needed because this part of the tree, that is the most valuable part, the solog, and uh, that one we processed in one of our five highly efficient sawmills. We produce, of course, solid wood products. The bark is used for the annual supply of the, of the mill, and that is a perfect balance. 10% of the log is going to energy production. In our case, just now, it is pellets. And approximately one third uh, becomes wood chips and is used in our pulp and paper mills. And here we also use the upper part of the tree, producing pulp and paper. Uh, but also here we have some different products from the process, tall oil, black liquor, bark. And that is again used for energy purposes as we also use uh, branches, the top of the tree, and so on. And in addition, as I said, we had 20% of installed capacity of wind power on SEA land. So this is a fantastic system, and uh, this one will always remain. And uh, what we have to do is to, at the every time, uh, adapt the right side to uh, give the opportunity to maximize the value from the tree all the way to the end customer. So that's the reason also why we took the decision two years ago to leave publication paper. And that's the reason why we're taking the decision to invest uh, four to five billion sec as an average during the past 10 years. So uh, I said that um, solid wood products and, and the wood products, they are essential in order to keep and increase the value of the forest. And just to give you some KPIs, SOLOGs, they uh, standing for 60% of the revenue for SEA uh, in the forest part, 65% of the profit, 47% of the volume. And the corresponding figures for pulp wood is 40% uh, revenue, 35% uh, EBITDA, and 53% volume. And the reason, of course, is that it is much cheaper to harvest uh, SOLOG in comparison with the uh, pulp with pulp wood. And also, of course, you have a higher value. Each solo represents a higher value than we have in, in the pulp wood. Uh, if we look at uh, this slide, uh, we can say that the total enterprise value of SEA was in March, I think it was 140 billion. Yesterday it was 110 or so, but it's up, up and down. But uh, let's say around 120 billion sec. 70% of the value here is uh, uh, represented by the forest, if you look into some uh, analyst reports and things like that. And as we already said, more than 50% out of that is related to our SOLOGs. Uh, the industry part of SEA is uh, estimated as 30% of the total company value, and 25% uh, of that asset is related to wood products. So all in all, you can see that uh, approximately 50% of the value uh, from uh, of SEA is relating from the wood industry and forest sawlogs. And I will come back later to, to the conclusions. 15, uh, 20 years ago, uh, we had to ask ourselves uh, who will invest in the sawmill industry in close connection to SEA's forest holdings. Uh, at that time, we were a very lousy performer in solid wood products, and the answer was, we have to do it ourselves. No one else should do it. Uh, we weren't too much focused on volume at that time. We were more focused on the structure. So we took the decision to be quite active here, and in 10 years, we have gone from 11 sawmills down to five sawmills. But as you can see on this side, uh, the volume is not is mo more or less the same because we feel that we always need to balance log availability with the capacity that we have in our sawmills. Otherwise, we will 
always fail. 75% of the cost for a sawmill is related to the log costs. I mean, th that is what we have to look into. Uh, we were more focused on uh, streamlining. We were focused on cost efficiency, productivity. We were focused on technique. I mean, here we're talking about uh, sorting, kilning, grading, and so on. And uh, uh, that is what we have done. And the result out of that um, journey has been that we have increased the productivity counted as uh, cubic meter per full-time employee by a little bit more than 60% during 10 years. And now it's maybe not too impressive with 4,000 cubic meter per man a year, but here you have to take into consideration that we the, the average log size for us is 165 liter or something like that. So it's a very small log. The cost reduction per cubic meter uh, calculated in the same way has reduced by uh, 20 to 25 percent during this period and due to the program that we decided 15, 20 years ago. The profitability in the sawmill industry is today very good in general and SEA as a company we are doing uh, okay. And uh, that is important, of course, because, um, uh, as I said, in the past, we were a very lousy performer here, but we can just now state that uh, solid wood products, that is a highly profitable business for us and also for all other companies today, more or less. Uh, because you were here, Don, I also did put in camphor here, and, and I think you are more or less uh, on the same level. Maybe the volatility is a little bit uh, higher in, in North America in comparison with what we have here in Europe. And that was also what you said. So, so But otherwise, it's... Uh, but we can state that just now it is a highly profitable business. And some uh, people, Lars Jöran, says that this will remain. And we trust you, Lars Jöran, and we will come back if, if you're wrong. But uh, it might be so. But of course, the <coughs> war and, and uh, what's happening now in, in with the Russian invasion that might have uh, some kind of uh, effect on the European economy that we cannot really uh, foresee. So, so but otherwise. Uh, SA is also, uh, we, we give a good and strong contribution to, the, to mitigate the climate change. And also in this perspective, solid wood products is the main contributor. And you have seen also um, uh, different uh, slides with this theme. But if we take this slide, uh, which uh, gives the story of SEA, starting with the forest again, it was already said that for each tree that we cut, we replace with three new ones. The growth in a new uh, seedling is 30% higher than in the old tree, which give a net uh, higher net binding capacity of carbon. In SEA, we also plant 10-15% to Contorta, and uh, in lodgepole pine, we have 40% higher growth in comparison with the scotch pine, which also give a net binding uh, capacity of binding carbon dioxide. We are quite intensive when it comes to silviculture operations. We do our pre-commercial thinnings, we do fertilization, and we do a lot of other things that makes the forest uh, grow very fast. So in SEA, the total growth every annual total growth is 10 million cubic meters and we harvest between five and six we have some windfalls and s some some volumes uh, disappearing in uh, pre-commercial thinnings and things like that but the net growth in our forests are today around four million uh, cubic meters and that give a net binding capacity of more than five million tons per year so this is the figure for 2021 but even more important is the substitution effect if we walk over to the right hand side. And here we talk about uh, replacing uh, uh, plastic with paper, uh, fossil fuels with bioenergy, uh, concrete, steel, and things like that with solid wood products. And uh, for SEA, uh, our operations last year gave close to 6 million tons of carbon dioxide in net binding capacity here. And then, of course, on the negative side, we have emissions from our operations. Ten years ago, a little bit more than two million tons. We've done a lot of investments, and for each investment that we make, we 
secure that we have also in this perspective an uh, effective new mill. And uh, we have by that lowered our emissions to 0 0.7 million tons of carbon dioxide per, per year. So in 2021, SA's climate benefit was 10.5 million tons of carbon dioxide, which corresponds to emissions from Sweden's uh, passenger cars. So that's quite a big contribution. And this is the clue, because uh, out of 10.5 million uh, tons, approximately six came from uh, the substitution effect, and out of that, food pro product represents 50%. That is the calculation within SA. And the reason for that is, of course, that wood is replacing fossil materials. And we were talking about uh, products with long lifespan. 90% of these products have a long lifespan. And last but not least, we have a lower um, fossil, we have lower fossil emissions from that this kind of operations in comparison with pulp and paper and, and so on. So this is my last slide, and I will try to sum up, because uh, this slide can, uh, well, maybe describe some of the strategy for SEA going forward. And I think we have three components here. And in the bottom, and that is really important, because I think it's so important that we continue to maintain a superior asset quality. I mean, we have to take care of what we have in the company. We spend quite a lot of money into this area, because... Uh, we will give uh, um, opportunities for uh, continuous improvements, continuously improving the productivity, cost efficiency, and so on. So that's uh, quite a big, uh, um, tha that's quite quite m much money into into this area. Then we have a couple of uh, ongoing big strategic projects. I mentioned the big craft liner project in Obola. That one will be up and running uh, latest next year. 8 billion, we have 2 billion in a new uh, pulp line at Utviken, where we did close down our publication paper business, will be up and running latest uh, beginning next year. We continue to buy forest land, 7 billion sec, and uh, just now we are performing the project together with SD1, uh, aiming to produce um, in all in all 200,000 cubic meters of liquid biofuels, but uh, our share of this will be 100,000 cubic meters. So this is uh, important that we can uh, uh, we can fulfill what we have promised in this in this area. Then going forward, I mean uh, we have potential for organic growth, and here we will be very much focused on uh, energy. We will put in substantial money into wind energy in different uh, ways. Uh, we will also uh, continue to perform other projects within renewable uh, liquid biofuels, renew renewable fuels. Uh, we have, of course, identified uh, further uh, de bottlenecking projects within pulp and paper, and we shall, of course, um, take care of them in due time. We will continue to buy forest, as I said. But uh, here, uh, last but not least, wood will be important for us. And, and again, we will continue to streamline our operations. We will focus on, on that. If we can uh, increase capacity, we will do that, but that must go hand in hand with log availability. Super important. Uh, so, and if I try to sum up, because the theme of this presentation was uh, what kind of rule does wood products have in SA? I mean, first, it is to secure the value of the forest, and by securing the value of the forest, then we secure the value of the SEA company. Uh, so that is really important. Wood, secondly, wood is good for the climate. Climate is good for the reputation. Reputation is good for SEA. So that is another point. And the third point, which is the most important one, wood is highly profitable business for us. So, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ulf, and congratulations to that high profitability. <laughs> um, one thing I noticed if, um, from your presentation, if you compare with what Lars said, as Strunz is kind of moving down a bit in the value chain, it seems to me that SEA is happy 
not going down towards uh, cross-laminated timber or mm. uh, uh, elements for construction. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on your choices here? How to place yourself in the value chain? I can give you a different answer, say, but uh, if I uh, take a serious one first. I think uh, it is a rather narrow market as it is just now. I think Stuenso is doing a fantastic job. I mean, it's a good strategy and, and I think you do exactly the right things. I don't think that you have place for another big one here and you need a complete portfolio and we don't have that volume inside the company. Mm. Uh, we are buying forest, Storenzo, they are selling their forest and we believe in forest and I mean that's another <laughs> angle of it. So, so and I think so far we've been right, so so <laughs> doesn't matter. And also what you say, I mean, uh, short term, I think you the profitability will be more even if you are further downstream, but, but I mean, uh, over time, I think we will have at least the same profitability mm. where we are just now. So that, that's another reason, but you, you have to do it in different ways. But again, I think that's uh, the reason also why the theme was the, the wood products role within SCA. I mean, conditions in SCA, I mean, uh, support, uh, I think the business that we have today in, in wood products. Mm. So, so that's, that's the reason. Okay, thank you. Anyone? You're awfully silent today, everyone. Mm. Um, one thought then, sort of on one of your presentations that you talked about lodgepole pine and fertilization, mm. which topics that sometimes come up as a bit contentious uh, from a uh, sustainability perspective. Mm. How is SEA thinking about that and using it? In the I, I think we have to see the difference between climate and environment. And, and when we talk about the climate, the only important thing is to maximize the growth. Mm. And I mean, both fertilization and also the use of lodgepole pine will maximize the growth. Then if you don't like the view of the lodgepole pine, that's a different thing, that's more environment. <laughs> but you have to differ that. And, and uh, I mean, often also you talk about biodiversity. And on SEA land, we haven't lost a single species during the past 30 years, but we have some, one, some new ones. I mean, that's also a special debate, but yeah. uh, I think it's really important to to split the view uh, f uh, between climate and, and environment. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Well, <coughs> thank you. <laughs> and going them f there f then from the north of Sweden to the south of Sweden, um, we're going to hear from Lotta Lyro from Södra Skogsägarna. Lotta was uh, appointed president and chief executive officer of Söda Skogsägarna in 2020. Prior to that, she had been president and chief executive officer of the Swedish home improvement chain, Claes Olsson, and held various leading positions within the IKEA group and Södra. She has a master of science in business administration from the Stockholm School of Economics and uh, spent several years with McKinsey and Company as a management consultant in the forest products industry. So let's hear from Wood Products role <laughs> at Söder. Thank you. Thank you so much. And actually, it was Peter who hired me at McKinsey for then and uh, um, sort of attract me into this fantastic industry. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone, and uh, uh, lovely to be here uh, uh, today. So um, we move from, from the north to the south, um, as you said. And the topic for my presentation is to give some perspectives also on the innovation e efforts that we are uh, uh, pursuing in Södra. Uh, first, uh, some words. Um, so th the topic uh, uh, for me will be about innovations and some different aspects of innovation that we are, are pursuing. Uh, but first, uh, some words about uh, Södra, for those of you who are not familiar with Södra. We uh, were founded uh, 80 years ago approximately by a number of uh, forest owners in southern Sweden. Today we have uh, 52,000 members, still a forest association, but also a big forest products uh, company with a turnover of approximately uh, 30 billion sets. Uh, we are in the pulp business, we're in the sawn um, timber business, uh, but we're also a big player in the energy market, uh, selling both electricity and uh, uh, district heating. So, uh, and the whole purpose with Södra is basically to maximize uh, the value of whatever comes out of our owner's uh, forests. 
And uh, we are very clear that we have our roots in the forest and uh, we always seek new opportunities and in that way we also develop the future um, in a bigger sense. And uh, uh, as Ulf has already been, uh, been on to, our climate, um, climate benefit comes from both uh, the carbon that is stored in our forests, but also from the products uh, that we produce and the fossil uh, alternatives that they replace. So in that sense, very, very similar um, uh, business. Uh, Södra was founded by a man called Gösta Edström. And um, um, very early he, um, he uh, said this, that um, what forest product will be used for in the future is today unknown, but make sure that you're not empty handed uh, with whatever happens. And uh, sometimes I almost feel like he already knew what would be happening in my office today in 2022, because uh, we are today contacted, but I would say by all industries um, across um, across sectors because everyone is seeking to replace the fossil uh, coal with green uh, a green coal atom and that's what we have in our forests right so so today uh, of course very much is happening and it's happening across our value chain uh, to the left you see uh, the bi biomethanol uh, um, operation we have in Mönsterås where we basically take out uh, that product from the ev evaporation process and uh, as a result, we have um, biofuel that is used in, for example, uh, uh, heavy boats. Uh, we are also active in the next step of that, in, in developing the next generation of uh, biofuels in a project called Silva, together with Statkraft in Norway. Uh, we uh, are a player in the dissolving pulp business, and uh, one of the most important development projects and innovation projects that we have there is that we uh, have... Um, developed te technology where we can add recycled textile fibers um, and produce a dissolving pulp product that is um, basically a mix of virgin fiber and recycled fibers. By the way, you can buy shirts made of exactly that in a retailer that I can tell you afterwards <laughs> uh, right now. So this is actually happening. Uh, and I think this is fantastic that we don't stay on a technological development and innovation track, that we also manage to commercialize all of these uh, great efforts that are happening in the effort of uh, improving the, the carbon footprint of, of um, so many things that we are buying and, and consuming. And then finally, of course, as already been mentioned uh, by several speakers, replacing uh, fossil-based building materials with wood is also an extremely important movement uh, for us. I think what's critical when talking about innovation in our business is to really take a value chain perspective because in order to drive innovation with the right purpose, you need to hold the have the whole value chain um, uh, with you, so to say. And, and for us, uh, the key principle when approving an innovation project is that the product that we will develop or the process that we want to change is the most effective one in the market. Uh, from a climate perspective, because we believe that sustainability and profitability will go hand in hand in the future. So in order to develop what's relevant for the market, with what the market will basically want to pay for, having sort of the right uh, carbon footprint is, uh, is essential. But uh, just like Ulf talked about, of course, it all starts uh, in the forest. And um, we have uh, approximately, our members have 2.7 uh, million hectares of uh, forest in southern Sweden. Uh, every second uh, forest owner um, in, uh, in uh, southern Sweden is a member of Södra. And if you look at it as a totality, uh, there is material for eight, um, eight, uh, several, uh, eight, eight leveled houses growing every four hours uh, in our members' forests. And, uh, the carbon that um, we, uh, we uh, store in our members' forests uh, compensates for, um, uh, for uh, one member compensates for 40 Swedes' carbon footprint. So it's, it's, um, it's when you think about it uh, like that, it's actually uh, enormous. What I think is critical, and I think what we as an industry need to become better at explaining also when it comes to the innovation agenda, is that if you take um, uh, this as an example, um, if we uh, take down 2,000 cubic meters of sawn timber uh, in the forest, 
there are a number of things that come out as a result of that. And of course, uh, you have the house again. So we have the house with um, eight, um, eight floors. But in addition uh, to having giving people a place to live, there is also a lot of other values coming out for the 128 uh, people living in this house. And that is, for example, 25 years of uh, paper that maybe Ulsten is uh, um, producing, uh, nine years of district heating, uh, 30 years of textile, six years of electricity, and a number of kilometers that you can drive uh, based on biofuel. And this is the magic, right, <laughs> of the business uh, that we are in. And again, driving innovation here and improving our products and our processes always need to happen in the context of this totality. Uh, because that is the basis for, for, of course, profitability, but also using resources um, in a wise way. And I think that's so important for us to convey uh, at all, uh, in all places. And uh, it's an understanding that we need uh, policymakers uh, on, on both on Swedish level, but I think uh, also on European level, we need to in increase the understanding of this in order to have the right business conditions and the right conditions for innovation uh, going forward. Um, we have also decided to uh, take one step uh, further down the value chain when it comes to being part of the movement in building more in, um, in wood. Um, so we are building a um, cross-laminated timber factory uh, number two uh, in Vara. Um, we, we see the, the market conditions slightly different, I should say, compared to what, uh, what Ulf was expressing. Uh, we believe that the demand is higher than the, in, than the capacity in the market right now, so therefore we see this as an interesting area for us to, to grow in. Um, and um, again, coming back to the value chain perspective, um, when looking at sort of the, the climate footprint, uh, of uh, cross-laminated timber, um, you can say that it's of course substantially better than concrete, um, as we see here. But we also measure uh, our own climate footprint here, which is then um, just uh, yeah, almost a fifth of um, the average climate impact that uh, cross-laminated timber has um, in general. And the reason for this is that our, um, our emissions in the value chain is lower than the average in the industry. And this again is uh, the result of innovation across the value chain. For example, our nurseries for plants is completely fossil free. Uh, it's also connected to decisions that we have made regarding how to uh, use biofuels in our transportation, um, transportations and logistics and so on. So uh, again, the products and the innovations that we can offer is very much a consequence of what we do in the, in the value chain in its totality. And we believe that there is much more to do here as well. So, so um, uh, this is an important area for us. And of course, apart from being um, sort of an interesting market to grow in, uh, being a climate smart choice, it can also be quite beautiful uh, to, uh, to building wood, which is uh, not so bad either. Uh, so, so coming back to Södra perspective, uh, we see this as an interesting opportunity for us to, to continue our uh, growth journey. And um, as uh, this is a picture of, of our strategic uh, focus areas. And um, having uh, sustainability in all our business decisions is really critical because that's how we build the, uh, the value chain for the future, the products uh, for the future. And uh, we truly believe that innovation will need to happen in order to pursue all of these, uh, all of these efforts. I would now like to take, take, a, take a slightly different angle into the area of innovation, because I also think that it's imp important to when you look at the, the sawn, um, the wood products industry to look at what is the, new, the next wave of optimization of productivity. And we've already heard about changing the structure, moving sort of to more towards a more cost-efficient structure. But I think there is another lever which we haven't used uh, so far, a and that is the power of digitalization. Um, coming from uh, the retail industry recently, uh, where digitalization is not only used in how to meet the customer in a new way, it's also used to optimize the value chain using AI and machine learning in new ways. 
Um, I see the, the potential in also using these technologies uh, in the wood product industry. And the reason the, this industry is so well suited for those tools is that the number of variables is enormous. Everyone who is, has uh, worked in a sawmill know the number of possibilities of how to use the log, right? And if you extend it all the way back to the forest, the, the opportunities, the possibilities are enormous. And they are bigger than what the human brain or what an Excel sheet can capture. And therefore, uh, we have decided to start an effort that we called, uh, call Flight Tower. And uh, basically what this is, uh, is um, it's not so, um, it's not, it is very much like a flight tower. It's about creating transparency across uh, the value chain and uh, at all times secure that we have the impact of decisions from the whole value chain with us in our decision making. Uh, compared to SCA, one big difference is that we don't have our forest in the, in the balance sheet. It's in our members balance sheet but it's still part of my and Södra's assignment to optimize the value of those forest assets. And if we take a value chain perspective, we can actually optimize from our members forest all the way to the customer. So what is it then that we are doing? Well, basically the basic, the, there are two basic things here. One is that we are putting all data that we have across the business together in one big data lake and making sure that people can access it and see it. And then we are adding uh, data science capabilities uh, into the company. It's very much about uh, AI and uh, machine learning that we are applying. And AI for us is not about artificial intelligence. It's about amplified intelligence because we believe strongly that it's the combination of, of using the, the sort of the data science capabilities and the human being, the experience, the, 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 the touch and feel that we get, the experiences that we get. If we combine that, that is when we get the strength. So with that as the base, what we are looking into is decisions that are made on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis across the value chain. It can be what to produce at what sawmill during a specific week, month, year. It can be how to select a customer. It can be how to, where to get a specific, um, uh, how to use a specific tree uh, in the forest. And then by using the combined set of data, we get a completely new power, you can say, to optimize um, the value chain. And this also is a basis for having new ways of working across uh, the company where we are working together in new ways, but also have transparency and we look all the, all the time at the same data. And, and I think this can be, an, an, this is an, an another way of working with innovation, right? Uh, we innovate the way we work, we innovate we the way we make decisions. And I strongly believe that here we have a new wave of increasing productivity from forest to, uh, to final product, in this case, uh, a wood product at our customers. Um, that we, and and we, we see very good uh, results in the pilots that we are running here and uh, are now in the process of scaling this uh, into to new areas as well. So this is a slightly uh, different take of innovation that we believe uh, strongly in. Then finally, uh, I was away from Södra for from 20, uh, 2008 and then came back at 20 in, in 2020, so 12 years. And one thing that really struck me is that um, along uh, all of these years, uh, robotization, for example, has strongly impacted so many industries. But I came to the stacker in Lanserås where I spent hours when I was a sawmill manager there uh, solving productivity problems. And the stacker looked the same. In so many industries, uh, robots are today uh, replacing what man is doing uh, because it's, much, it's a much, uh, much more productive but also much more secure way of working. And I haven't seen that happening in our industry yet. So I think we have so many more opportunities when it comes, for you, uh, when it comes to using, using robotization, automization, autonomous vehicles. We have an enormous logistical uh, setup right, in, our, in our business as well. And here, I, I think we have to look at other industries. What is happening there? 
are there alternative suppliers to work with in order to move the borders that are I feel are today present in our industry and limiting this development? And uh, I really look forward to being part uh, of the journey of rethinking production processes and, and uh, inviting new players um, into this arena, which is so important for, for the whole uh, climate transitions that we are in as a society, but also for the profitability of our, of our business. So, so many opportunities. Uh, we continue with our route in the forest to develop the future in this way. Thank you so much. Thank you, very, thank you very, very much, Lotta. Um, very interesting to see. You talk about on your last slides there a lot about digitization and getting inspiration from other industries. Mm. Are there any particular industries that you get inspired by, or is it to cherry pick where you can find? I, I think if you if you look at um, uh, the value chain uh, that we uh, that we uh, have in uh, in our business, mm. it's supply planning. It's demand planning. It's very generic uh, processing in, so in a way. Mm. And then we have a lot of uh, variables that other industries might not have mm. uh, because we have, a, as I said, so many uh, opportunities. But I think in essence, very much of the, the, the data science behind those models is, is very generic and mm. you, can, you, can, you can learn a lot. And I, I think the big journey here is actually a cultural one and a leadership one because it's also about us learning and us inviting new, uh, you can say, new competences and new skills into the company and, and, uh, and uh, m marrying that with all the experience and all the, every, you know, all the knowledge that sits in the, w in the walls, right? So, so it's very much, I would say, a change management and leadership journey rather than inventing a lot of new things. Which must be a big challenge, right? I mean, some of your pictures there with flight towers and yeah. digital twins yeah. sort of sounds very, very different from the normal yeah. sawmill operations. Yeah. And I, Lars earlier talked about how they, I think, separate sort of the new growing businesses mm. sort of I in a sense, in an organizational sense, mm. from the traditional. Mm. How are you thinking about managing all mm. that challenge? Yeah, I, I, I think you always need a nursery for completely new things in order mm. to make sure that sort of the big mothership doesn't kill it in the beginning. That, that's my experience. But, but, I, but I think uh, very quickly you need to in parallel on board leadership because at the end of the day, uh, it's in the integration between experience and you know wherever you come from yeah. and the new world, that's where the magic will happen. Mm. So, so I, I very strongly believe in that. And it's more of, I think it's a leadership philosophical thing, right? But, but that's, um, that's my belief. Inspirational, thank mm. you. Any other questions from the audience? If you can. There you go. Uh, a question which alludes to what you just talked about. How do you get people to see the possibility in the change and not feel threatened by it? Because, I mean, robotization, uh, it's a fantastic opportunity, but I can also see that people, at least in our, where in our industry and in other industries, could feel threatened by sort of the new steps. Yeah, I, I think it's very good, very, very important to, at an early stage, develop clear examples. And, and coming back to your question, Peter, Inviting, inviting people to be part of and not be sort of left outside and you create this black box which people can't relate to. So, so we spend, uh, it's, it's a more cumbersome road from a leadership perspective to actually have people be part of the journey from the beginning and, and sort of take the discussion then. But, but I believe that's how you create the sort of the long-term feeling of being part of the journey and not be threatened rather than, than sort of being left behind and, and then you need to onboard people later. Uh, th then, then of course, it's about also giving people the opportunity to learn. So what we have done is that we have set up a, a training program uh, which people, uh, you can take a sort of a short AI course to just understand what is this, so that you don't create sort of a distance between people that know and that don't know. So everyone needs to have the opportunity and the, the preconditions to be part of the journey. So that is what we have done. Is it easy? I, do you avoid everything? No. And that's where you as a leader has to be part of it as well and, and drive the change, right? And, and uh, help people uh, sort of become part of it. So, yeah. Very inspirational. Any other questions? Then thank you very much again, Lotta. Thank you. 
And then rounding off the list of speakers before we get to a final discussion with all the speakers, uh, I would like to introduce Peter Holmgren, who's a senior forestry and environmental professional with the research credentials in forest management and economics. He, get, he got his PhD in 1995 on the topic of geographic information for forestry planning. He has more than 20 years of senior level experience with intergovernmental organizations uh, and processes, including negotiations and uh, diplomacy, with among others uh, the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the, of the United Nations, and as Director General for the Center for International Forestry Research, CIFOR, which is an international organization headquartered in Indonesia. Since 2018, he is back and based in Sweden, uh, working with corporations and industry federations in the forest-based sectors. He's going to talk about one of the key themes that we, that we have seen during the discussions today, sustainability connected to wood products. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. I better get rid of this one now. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's a challenge to come in at the end of the day after so many prominent speakers talking so much warmly about sustainability and innovation and what we're going to solve in the world. Um, thing is, it doesn't, the story doesn't always work because there are still many people out there who think that this is an old-fashioned industry that destroys nature and barely makes any money in the, progress, in the process. And we see that play out a lot in the, in the politics at the moment. So I, I think my, my contribution today will be more about how can we tell that story that we think we have right in a much better way than what we do? And how can we make that impact the rest of the world in a better way than we are able to do at the moment? So I put the subtitle to, to, sp to uh, uh, raise the appetite a little bit. Why harvesting is the best climate action in the forest? Um, First, then, the sustainability case. This was the title I got for my presentation. And I think that to, to get to that story that I mentioned just before, I think we need to take a good think about wha what do we mean by forestry? And by forestry, I include the value chain and all the good products and services that we're providing. And I think we need to go back to, to the broader perspective because sustainability easily becomes very narrow as, as a concept. And if you look at the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, that is somehow still a frame for what we are trying to achieve to, to, uh, for future generations, you can say that forestry contributes to many of these. And you can talk about rural income to combat poverty. You can talk about making contributions to food security, which is the second goal. You can talk about health aspects and maybe particularly safe packaging, which is a major contribution. You can talk about water balance. Many parts of the world are depending on forests for a safe water supply. Bioenergy, it's been mentioned today, and it's becoming more and more important as the world develops. Economic growth is part of the Sustainable Development Goals. Innovation is part of the Sustainable Development Goals. All of these things we've mentioned today already. Building in wood, of course, sustainable cities. Or using all the biomass mentioned by several speakers already. Climate solutions, I'll come back to that one. And of course, nature conservation. We need to take care of what we manage. And finally, collaboration. These are just a few examples of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. We need to have the full picture in our story. And one way to express it is that forestry is about all contributions to sustainable development made possible through forests and trees. But today, however, the focus will, as with several of the previous speakers, be on how do, we, how do we fix the global climate? Isn't that the main role that we have besides making money? So, forest, wood, and climate change, the circular bioeconomy. I'll talk a little bit conceptual about that first to, to get us to understand what is the problem in the policy arena. We want to see our sector like this. It's a circular forest bioeconomy. We have our forest that we manage well. From a climate perspective, it's a net sink, at least still, and at least in, in the Nordic countries. Um, we harvest, we make lots of good products. These products continue to store carbon. 
and they also displace fossil emissions. We recycle these products many times. This is an extra benefit. And finally, we recycle that carbon, or I should say sooner or later, we recycle that carbon back through the atmosphere to the forest. This is the beauty of the sector, and this is the message we need to, need to convey in terms of carbon. Still, it's not convincing enough. There is something we can add, though, and th that is the increasing technologies coming to a C CCU and CCS. That will bring back even more of that carbon to be used again or stored back under underground. So, I mean, we have a fantastic case to make here. Um, but to understand some of the uh, issues we're facing. We need to go back to the origins of the climate change policies th and to the Climate Change Convention, wi which was founded in 1992 in the Rio Conference, which in fact was the Stockholm Plus 20 Conference. If, if we hadn't had the conference in 72 in Stockholm, we wouldn't have had Rio and we wouldn't have had the Climate Change Convention, at least not in the way it looks today. In the convention, a very clear case is made that we need to do thi two things to fix the climate. One is to reduce our emissions, that's the big task. All those fossil emissions need to come down. Um, and there are some other greenhouse gases too that we need to reduce. That's the first goal. The second goal is to conserve and enhance sinks and reservoirs of carbon. This is very much in our ecosystems. We can't afford to let the forests turn into carbon dioxide. So that's about the sinks. And this dichotomy, this structure has flowed through the climate change negotiations for 30 years. It's in the Kyoto Protocol, it's in the Paris Agreement, it's in the EU Green Deal, it's in the national climate goals, including in Sweden, and it's also in many corporate goals to achieve net zero. The emissions remaining under the first goal should be compensated by reductions under the second goal. This is a basic fundamental structure of climate policy. And unless we realize that, we don't understand why we're having a problem. Our sector, of course, contributes to both goals. We have the forest, it's a net sink, it enhances the, the uh, sink, it builds the rest of, of carbon, that's the second goal, and it contributes to the first goal, it reduces fossil emissions. So, we do both. What's the problem? Well. The problem can be expressed like this. If you look at the EU Green Deal, it's just one example. Um, it's been expressed in this way, uh, graphically, that until 2050, we need to reduce our fossil emissions dramatically. And that's the upper part of the curve. Today, we have about 4 billion tons of emissions in the EU. They need to go down dramatically until 2050. At the same time, the EU has a net sink which is under the x-axis. That's a much smaller portion. But the trick here is that politically, by 2050, they should be balanced, which means we have a net zero situation. That's good. Or problem is that the forest always ends up below the x-axis. It only shows up when it comes to contributing to the second goal. We don't get any credit for contributing to the first goal, and yet this is our main task, our main possibility. But this is not balanced in, in, the, in the EU policy at the moment, and that's why we see a lot of ideas about how to enhance the carbon sink in the forest, but we see very few. Well, there are some building in wood, etc. And if you're kind, there is a bit on bioenergy too. But we don't really see a balance between the two goals that we contribute to. You can express it in this way. Our circularity that we are very proud of has been cut off. So we are either looking at the forest or we are looking at the value chain, but we're not looking at them together. The circular feature becomes invisible to politics and instead forestry or wood harvesting as it is, is often described as a problem. In fact, IPCC in its global models expresses forestry and other land use as 11% of the climate problem. That's not really the picture we want to, want to come up with. So we have an issue here, which is a fundamental structural issue in policies. 
and, and you can almost make a parallel to gender policies. You, unless you understand the underlying structures and the history in the background, you don't understand the problem. Okay, let's take a more positive view on what's happened in the Swedish forest-based sector over the past 30 years. We, before I do that, I want to take a picture since we have several international friends and, and colleagues with us today. I want to show this graph to illustrate that it depends on where you are in the world. It's very different. The situation is very different. Um, on the x-axis here we have the percentage of private ownership of the forest land and on the y-axis the intensity of forest management expressed as how much do we harvest per hectare for the industry. And if you do this graph, and the size of the bubble is the size of the forest, if you do this you can see that Sweden and Finland kind of stands out dominated by private ownership and we, with, despite our cold climate, a high intensity in forest management. The rest of the EU falls a little bit below, but that's not entirely true because the EU is, is a variety of countries and, for example, Austria has even more private ownership than, than Sweden and Finland. So it's not entirely true to look at the EU in this way. But you can also see some other regions, uh, particularly the one to the bottom left, where we have a low uh, private ownership rate ratio and we have seen over the entire forest area a low forest management intensity and of course this is where we find Canada. I'm not going to draw any conclusions from this picture, I'm just going to explain that we have a very different situation depending on where we are in the world. So with the Swedish forest industries we issued a report early this year to illustrate the climate impact of the sector over the past 30 years. And there, this is no secret to any of you that we've seen a tremendous development of the forests, not just over the past 30 years, as you see here, but over the past 100 years. Over the past 30 years, we increased the standing volume by about 25% in the Swedish forest. That's almost 1% per year. It's a lot. As you can see in the bottom graph, we not only added the dark green part to the standing volume, we also harvested an enormous amount of wood to be used for, for uh, renewable products. No secrets uh, in this room. Um, but of course, it's, an eth it's, an, it's a factor of conscious policy and conscious investments over a very long time. Our products, of course, followed that trend. Here we can see the blue line, which is the solid wood products, went up by almost 50% over this 30-year period. And these are official statistics, no secrets. Um, you often hear in, in that we should have more long-lived products. Well, we do, because we increased the production by 50% over the past 50 years. Um, you see the orange line is the uh, pap pulp and paper products. It didn't increase as much. It was more or less stable volume-wise over, over this 30-year period. But then you see the black line. That's the bioenergy. And at the Swedish level, that has increased dramatically over the past 30 years. Not all of this comes from the forest. Uh, and in the past 10 years, it's also some imported biofuels. But most of it, more than 80%, comes from the forest. It has been described already today. It's the, it's the side streams of our value chains that results in a lot of bioenergy, which we have invested in taking care of in, in our country. Um, in fact, bioenergy is so prominent in, in this study, so I, I, I have given it a slide of its own. If you, if you look at the total energy consumption, the use of energy in Sweden, it has been rather constant over the past 30 years, around 350 to 400 terawatt hours per year, um, which is amazing because we are quite, m quite a few more people in Sweden now than 30 years ago, and our economy has grown quite a lot. Still, we use the same amount of energy. But the share of bioenergy has gone up dramatically. And is today between 30 and 40% of total energy use. It's our biggest energy source. And if you mirror that with the red line, which is our declining fossil emissions in Sweden, you see that you can explain that decline almost entirely by from bioenergy increases. That's not a full, all a full explanation, of course, but it's an interesting view to have in mind. A big part of this, of course, is also inside the forest industry, which has gradually 
um, adopted by energy as, as the main or only source of energy. So what are then the results of all this, these developments for the climate? We used the same model as been presented earlier here by both Stovenso and SCA, that uh, we look at the change in the forest, how much net sink do we have? This is the goal two, what I mentioned before. How do we enhance the sinks? Secondly, we look at displacement and substitution. How much do we reduce fossils? That's the first goal, as I mentioned before. And then we have to deduct the fossil emissions we, we contribute ourselves, and then we get a total. So over these 30 years, first of all, the emissions of the sector declined dramatically. They are less than half today compared to 30 years ago. That's both because the industry has been moving away from fossils and used much more bioenergy today, probably more e energy efficient as well. And it's also because transport, which is now the main emission, has also become more efficient over these 30 years. Then we have the green line. This is the net sink. We know from official numbers, our National Forest Inventory, our reports to the Climate Change Convention, that we're continuing to build in carbon in the Swedish forest and in the products that the Swedish forest industry uh, uh, delivers. This has been high, it has been persistent. It's about 40 million tons of carbon dioxide per year. And by comparison, the, the territorial emissions, all our emissions in Sweden is about 45. So we are, you know, only the sink in the forest contributes quite well to, to balance our emissions. And then we have the orange line. This is the displacement. And because the product volumes have gone up over this 30 period, of course, we also displace more fossils. For the same functions out in society, we need less and less fossil thanks to the increase of forest-based, wood-based products. So the increase has been from about 30 to just about 50 million tons of carbon dioxide per year for Sweden as a whole. And that's a big increase. If you add these up, you see that the total effect has gone from 60 to 90 over 30 years. That's 1 million tons of carbon dioxide increase for every year over the past 30 years. I'm going to make a comparison here. Um, we hear a lot about fossil-free steel from Sweden these days. Popular subject in politics, much more popular than forestry, I think. Um, and it's good. This is our biggest emitter. If we get rid of the fossil in steel production, it will be a great, uh, great, great step towards a fossil-free society. And if we do that, then what will the, the quantity of that is that 8 million tons per year will be removed over a period of 10 years. So that pace of, re of removing emissions is slower than the increase of the forest-based sector's contribution. We do more increasing benefit per year than the fossil-free steel development if they succeed. I need some windmills, I've heard. Um, so we stored 1.4 billion tons of carbon in our forest, in our products. We, we uh, avoided 1.3 billion tons of emissions. And in 2020, this effect is twice counteracting our territorial emissions. Interesting thing is that this story is contested. And why is that? These are some of the annual reports from last year. Um, five for corporations, their combined profits, and it was a good year, it was 31 billion. Their combined positive climate effect was 55 million tons of carbon dioxide. That's, that's a good win-win. And expressed in a different way, for each Swedish crown, each single Swedish crown in profits, the climate benefit was two kilos of carbon dioxide for each, each crown. Um, I said all the things, so I don't have to repeat them. But I'm coming back now to my, my subtitle. Why is harvesting the best climate action in the forest? Well, it's a two-way street. I think we can agree that the wood delivery reduces fossil emissions. We all say that, and, and it does, and it does so in large quantities. 
But it also works the other way around. The demand for wood leads to investments in long-term forestry, which leads to increase in carbon stock. This is the politics we've been working along for a hundred years in Sweden and in some other countries too. And it works. There are studies, recent studies that shows that countries where you don't have a long-term stable wood demand, you don't get the same investments and the forest carbon stock is stable or decreases. But it increases because of the harvesting. That's a little bit counterintuitive, but it's still true. Um, so, we let's place that two-way street where it belongs. It's the harvesting that helps us perform our climate actions in, in the forest-based sector. And, and this is maybe my main point in this talk, that is why we have to move the climate valuation of the forest-based sector from carbon in the forest to carbon in what we harvest. Today we have a lot of emphasis on market-based solutions for paying for carbon to be stored in the forest. Carbon credits. Um, principle a good idea. Problem is that it only looks at one of the two climate change goals. And the problem is also that it may, be, it may hamper the harvest that we now have proven is the solution to, to the climate action. If we instead looked at the sustainable harvest as the enabling factor, and if we put the valuation of the, for, of the climate solution there, then we would have a completely different game to play. So if we can all travel to Brussels and convince some people from that, then please. Um, okay. Short, a few take home messages. This is my last slide. Um, I think I mentioned all this, but managed forests provide large and stable negative emissions, and that depends on a viable forest sector. Otherwise, we don't get those investments in forest management. If we talk about the climate impact of forests, we must include the impact of the wood based product because both of the mitigation objectives are being addressed. Those policy and market mechanisms that only consider negative emissions in the forest are likely to be ineffective. And two examples are the Lulu CF, the Land Use, Land Use Change and Forestry Regulation, um, where we only look at how much more carbon can we store in our forest. And there is some thinking that we can add on carbon in the forest forever, um, which is of course not possible. And the other, as I mentioned, is carbon credits in standing forests that only looks at one of the two benefits. So wood harvesting is the best climate action, at least in Swedish forests. And I should add, of course, that given that we take care of nature, we do the set aside, we manage uh, conditions for bi biological diversity and for social needs and all of the, all the rest of that. But as we do that, harvesting is what brings the best climate action. And it's a two or even three way street. It provides investments in forest management, which gives more negative emissions. It provides climate smart products that reduce fossils. That's less fossil emissions. And eventually it provides the opportunities for large scale capturing of carbon dioxide. I think that's a pathway that we need to explore further. So, um, I hope I followed up all the positive looking future visions with some calibration of policy realities here. Thank you. Thanks a lot for those thoughts, Peter. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions, so uh, let me start with one. That, that, that fossil products can re kind of avoid emissions from Sorry, that wood products can make us avoid emission from fossil products through, through replacement seems intuitively right. It, it does appear that it's a bit difficult to measure and quantify. How would you reckon that we can get across and sort of solve that kind of issue? Yeah, th there is a fair amount of studies that have looked into individual products of mm. different kinds and, and have estimates. There are a number of LCAs that you can use to, to get to the numbers. But I think the, 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 the root of the problem is that 
since this hasn't been part of the official reporting format. And in fact, those displacements happen in other sectors, mm. so they're difficult to capture. Makes it a little bit uncertain as, as it is. And it doesn't add that, that a lot of argumentation is about, oh, no, no, it doesn't really displace anything because you, what, you, what you gain here, you will lose over here, etc. But I also want to raise another thing, and that is that sometimes you hear the argument that, yes, uh, displacement is all good and fine, but eventually we will have a fossil-free society and then displacement disappears. Um, maybe this is the case. But I would argue that this is also a two-way street because mm. it's not only that the steel becomes more fossil-free or the concrete becomes more fossil-free. Um, it's also that wood-based products evolve too. And we heard lots of examples of that today. Um, and in fact, I, I think it was Lars who mentioned that we also need to learn how to build houses with less wood. And of course, if, if resources become scarce, we use less to do more. And if you use the same quantity of wood to build two houses instead of one, mm. then you've doubled your displacement effect. Yeah. Uh, audience, thoughts, questions? Let me then continue my, my question. <laughs> could, so from what you're saying, could you imagine a future where um, the storage in products as well as in the forest and the replacement or displacement can create concrete monetary benefits to the forest products companies? And how would that work? Uh, well, we see a lot of uh, trials with the carbon credit markets today. Mm. Uh, we see a lot of thinking along along these lines. They haven't really reached how do we pay for displacement yet. Although there is a system for that. It's called in the European Union, it's called ETS. Mm -hmm. So all the other sectors, they can trade and benefit from reducing their emissions, but the forest-based sector can't. So we're kind of, we're out of that and we are only have, have uh, ideas on how to pay for credits in the forest and we don't have anything that pays for our product. This is a problem. Um, on the other hand, maybe it's not the it doesn't go back to the payment at the end of the day. Maybe it is the added value of, of hmm. being fossil free and, and contributing to the development that we need that will pay off as it is. Okay. One yeah, Leonard. What is needed, do you think, to uh, get this story written down and communicated to a greater audience? I think it's getting there. I think uh, over the past years, I think the story has matured. And uh, un unfortunately, the, the new war situation has speeded up, has sped up that, that development. And I think there is a bigger realization of, of the needs that we need for, for our future today. Um, but there's still a lot, lot of work to, to be done. Um, and as I said, go to Brussels, tell the story. I, I wanted to just continue on mm. one of the things you said last time. You said it in a brief sentence, but kind of your main or one of your main theses here is that harvesting is the best climate action. Mm. Does that... Sustainable harvesting. Sustainable harvesting. Yes, and that's what I wanted to elaborate on. There, there is more, there is an increasing concern for saving the forest and mm -hmm. being very careful with biodiversity. Including that into your thinking, does that change the thesis? And if so, how? Well, you shouldn't harvest all forests. Mm -hmm. That's clear. And, mm -hmm. and we don't. Um, and as I also, I think I mentioned that it doesn't take away the, the needs and obligations and, and mm -hmm. considerations for nature conservation and social values, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to see the broader sustainability picture. But within that frame, Looking at forest management, harvesting is what does the trick. Hmm. Um, if you just leave the forest, it will be good for many other things, possibly, but it will not be good for the climate. Okay, good. With that, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, I think stay up here on okay. stage because the intention of the last piece of this program is to have all the speakers back up on stage here again.
Uh, and uh, some of you are sort of ha already have your mics. Uh, others, I think, will need to use this thing, right? And I might need technical support to ensure that everyone has a microphone. Please. I talked worse than I don't have the ability, so you have to do it. Oh, no, 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 no. Choose the right and, uh, <laughs> time. I in the <laughs> easiest <laughs> possible <laughs> way. Yeah, yeah. We don't have any sofas to sit in or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's been two, at least that I perceive, two key themes in what we've heard about today. It has been around sustainability and it's been around technology. And, and I'd like to probe a little bit more on, on that second one, sort of the use of digitalization, artificial intelligence, whatever it might be. A and, and ask particularly those of you who are the in industrialists, if I may say so, how do you see this evolving in the next 10, 15 years? What's your vision of what the wood products industry might look like from forest all the way to the customer. Will we have black sawmills, so completely automated sawmills with no one actually working in them I in, the, in the next decade or decade and a half? Don, do you want to start? Sure, I'm happy to start. I, so that's an excellent question and it's one that we uh, talk about an awful lot ourselves and we you know, we like to think with some of the investments we've made here recently that we've got state-of-the-art sawmills and we like to, we're operations period, and we like to use those terms, but what we're really trying to understand here, what does the sawmill of the future look like, to your point? And we've heard, you know, the comments, I think you, Lena, you talked about automation, we talked robotics, and, and all some of those things. And I, I, my own personal opinion is I, I think we will see, uh, first of all, a lot more automation. I think, you know, if you look at our industry, you know, yeah, we got examples of robotics just to use that, um, but nowhere near where I think we, we need to be and what the capabilities are for sure. I mean, really, when you look at our operations, they're material handling operations, really, at the end of the day. And so if you, if you think about just using the car, the auto uh, companies as an example, you got to believe that if you look out here 5, 10, 15 years, that we will be much more automated. I see, I see robotics being just all of them, pretty, pretty much every function can be replaced with robotics. And then we'll have um, <coughs> all the... Um, you know, remote access to all the information. So I, I don't see any reason why there has to be an awful lot of people in the operations, and it uh, it can all be done remotely for sure with the mm -hmm. smart devices that we have even today, for that matter. And I, I think, and it's important. Not everywhere in the world. I think in Sweden it's maybe less of an issue, but certainly in North America we should not have the people. Mm. So you know, I, that's another kind of. Um, uh, reason why we need to follow through on that as well because we just don't have the people and the only way we're going to solve that is to continue to push this real real aggressively on the automation front so we I certainly see it as a, a big opportunity for the future. Lotta you talked about that with a big yeah. smile. What's yeah I did. No but I, I think apart from a sort of taking productivity to the next level and so on I think there is another really important upside and that is the fact that our industry uh, is from a work safety perspective three times as dangerous as average manufacturing in Sweden. And I don't think if there's a lack of people yeah, yeah. Uh, and if we, have a pos uh, if we have a difficulty to attract people to working in our industry, I think, we, we I mean, this is sort of an obvious one that you just need to solve, right? Hmm. And, and, uh, and uh, f for me, this is one of the most important reasons why we need to change this because we, we do have, uh, for example, I, I talked about the stacker. You know, when I see, when I, you know, you know, everyone has seen a stacker and you know what happens when things go wrong in there. You, someone has to climb in and fix it, right? Super dangerous, I mean, super dangerous operation and it could be solved by yeah. technology that is out there. Mm -hmm. So I, I think from a, from, a, from a people perspective, this is our obligation to look into in order to solve this, to solve this issue that is, uh, I think, not acceptable uh, in 2022 that we have this situation, mm. actually. Those of you who are forest owners and sort of think about the entire value chain, sort of will, you s will we see a, a seamless uh, flow of information from each particular individual sort of tree to where which sawmill and which customer is supposed to go to? Or how do you see th that entire development? Well, that will not happen. We have worked with that in 30 years, and, and <laughs> uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we will do it that way. But if, if um, just to add something here, I mean, we to judge the future, you have to look into the past, and I mean, in 10 years, we've done 60% of productivity improvement. 
that will happen again and again and again, of course. And, and sooner or later, you are exactly maybe not without people in the in the middle, but I mean that you reduce the number of pe people, of course. And, and I also I can just agree with the, this security perspective. I mean, we have to be better mm. in that perspective. Mm. But I don't think to be f fully integrated value chain. But I think we have a lot of things to do in the when it comes to create value of of the of the products. I mean, we are just now running a project in Bolsta um, uh, with a CT scanner. It's mm -hmm. like uh, yeah, as exclusive as if you try to find out whether you have cancer or not, and and we can use it. And we have it's uh, it's uh, I mean, we, we it's a fantastic technique and you need a lot of competence of course but it is a great potential so both productivity but also value creation so will you steal the competence from the hospitals yes that's <laughs> possible because it's exactly the same technique mm -hmm. well Lars yeah um, I'm not to repeat what has been said but I think there is a huge opportunity for cross-sector digitization um, mm -hmm. beyond just our big opportunity we have within um, wood product corporations so to get closer to Stefan's business, right? To get closer to the construction industry, to get closer to recycling. Recy <laughs> we're all standing here and all agreeing on it, but we're just one sector, right? We have huge mm -hmm. opportunities, but there is a lot of sectors who are not in this room. And one that is very far away is recycling, mm -hmm. right? And I think we have so much waste wood today. Um, and, you know, if we get those ones on board as well by, you know, digitizing, by planning early on for that also commercial process, not just the technical recyclability of products, I think digitization can play a big role across the whole value chain. Right. S Stefan, how do you see that sort of? Uh, continuous improvements. Uh, yeah. The result of that should not be uh, over reducing the staff. It should be used in investing in more capacity. Okay. So I think uh, uh, moving uh, brain dead work into other kind of work is where digitalization can put uh, added value. Hmm. Any other comments uh, on that? Any questions on the audience on that particular topic? Okay. L l let me then switch to the other theme which I think has come through here, which is again around sustainability. And we started talking about that a little bit, Peter, right? Just wanted to hear if, if, if all of you had about the same thoughts. With the increasing demands on conservation of forest or sort of careful harvesting of forests, and you've seen a different situation in Canada, for example, Don. Um, can we combine the increased demand for wood products, or how do we combine the increased demand for wood products with that, those requirements and requests? How do the... Uh, Shall we start with, sto with store answer this time? <laughs> yeah, so I think one thing I've already tried to say is, is that the overall industry across the different business sectors we have will have to focus more on long-lived products um, to a certain degree and maybe sometimes take a little bit of a slow step in terms of what that means to your profitability because you know it might not always benefit us in the short run um, um, but I agree with you Lotta in the long run whatever is the best solution from a sustainability point of view long term will also be profitable um, so um, yeah does more long-lived product mean that we'll see more panels in Sweden the coming panel industry coming back to Sweden? Yeah, I mean, maybe if I just continue with it, what I, re what I mean with this is, is that basically the, 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 the opportunity is there that not only we can improve our use of logs for long-lived products more, hmm. but also that, um, you know, the whole opportunity still, as I think Lars Jordan said in the beginning, with hybrid solutions should not be just wiped away and we're a little bit like... A yeah like a one-sided, you know, um, um, radical list on just sustainability stories and, you know, overnight not wanting to work together with the steel or the concrete industry, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it, it, it won't happen overnight, right? We will not be able to, to take over all um, um, construction demand with wood. Piotr, I saw you. Yeah, no, uh, this concept of long-lived products is really a double-edged sword, in, in, in my view, um, because of course it's good. Of course we want to have long-lived products. It's a good thing and we would store the carbon for much longer. But then again, the reason why long-lived products are so popular in the politics is that they want to oppose 
bioenergy and, and pulp and paper industry. It's not only that they like the long lived, it's that they oppose the other. And secondly, if we only talk about long lived products, it means that we're only talking about the storage. What is much more important when we build a house which is long lived is that we are reducing the fossil emissions in constructing the house. That's five times more important from a climate perspective mm -hmm. than it is to store the carbon. So long lived products, yes, it can serve us well, but there are some other sides to that concept. Mm. Lotta, as a, as a member organization, you more than perhaps most need to take a very much consideration into what your members mm. think and how they want to use their forest. Mm. How do you see this balance between sort of more demand for wood products and uh, maybe a grassroots member demand for more or different ways of managing the forest? Mm. No, uh, we, 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 we truly believe in that it's possible to combine the role of the forest both as a source for bio biological diversity as a coal feed, but also to, as Stin said, yeah, use, um, use what comes out to replace fossil-based products. So we don't believe that there is a... I mean, of course, if you polarize it, it's a contradiction, right? But uh, we, we think that it's possible to find a good solution. And, and, and I think it's important to remember that there is a lot of good things done already today. And, and what we very much are working with now is also to, to show the world that. Mm. And uh, w one of the things that we decided just some weeks ago to do is to, to, to the forest owners, to the members that actually have a, a character of their estate where they have a special conservation area that represents a larger part than what is sort of the basic, the basic for an FSC certification. We actually uh, give them a premium when they deliver um, their raw material to us. Mm. Because um, as a collective, we are also dependent on them to, to have that they have that larger part. And that gives us as an association in its totality a good position. So. I, I think we can also, by those type of actions, actually put a value on the natural conservation that our members are actually mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's one way of, you know, w not traveling to Brussels and, and showing, <laughs> telling the story, <laughs> but actually showing that it's worth something. Because when I meet customers uh, uh, on um, at one specialty paper producer, for example, the demands that they are getting from retailers that they do business with mm. is enormous, right? when it comes to, they, they get lot, tons of questions on how they manage the, how the forest does they, it goes into their raw materials managed and so on. So I think it's important that we don't only tell the story, but that we also put a value hmm. on all the great work that is done when it comes to nature conservation and, and uh, sort of good, uh, good work. So I, I think that's an important part of it too. And that's how we're trying to do it from a member perspective as well. Yeah. Don, what nuances yeah. do you see? Because you see also different geographies, partly crown-owned forest, right? So how does that... You know, well for sure, and I think it was interesting, Peter, to hear you talk as well, because we, that whole debate around, you know, the, the, the standing timber and the sequestering capability of standing timber versus processed timber, and uh, the differences there, and we're seeing the same pressures now in North America, it just sort of surfaced in the last 24 months, probably, and uh, more pressure for to demonstrate that the, the environmental groups particularly are trying to demonstrate that it's the standing timber is going to sequester more carbon. And so, you know, it comes down to, and we've all talked about it, is, you know, trying to kind of graduating from looking at ourselves as competitors, trying to figure out collectively how can we tell the story better, get the narrative right. Because what, 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 what was happening, I think, you know, and we're, we're getting there now, but up until, you know, a year ago, even a year and a half, two years ago, we were all looking at ourselves as competitors. Well, we had a great story to tell collectively, mm. but we weren't being successful. So we're, you know, on that topic. I mean, I, I think that, you know, what, you know, and there's still a lot of work being done to prove that out. And there's always a lot of, you know, dissenters and everything else. But it's, you know, uh, we believe in the managed forest. We call it working forest in uh, no mostly nor working forest in North America. But really, what it means is, to a large degree, if we can, if we can have a managed forest we can deal with is going to eliminate or at least mitigate the risk of wildfires, which is a huge issue in, in North America, insect infestation, those sorts of things. And 
and then you know and as as the as the um, fiber ages obviously there's the the carbon sequestering capability reduces right mm -hmm. so then you convert it and then you can you've got you can store in uh, solid wood for for a much longer period so we're we're going through all that uh, right now as we speak we're going to, we're in the process of of spending 50 million dollars for the first time as an industry in North America and we call it the working force initiative and it's all around trying to get our story to the right audience and what's the right narrative so that you know we can make the kind of progress that we've been uh, we just haven't made and, and I think part of this because our industry in North America at least we're too timid and we, we don't get our we just for some reason we stay in the back and so we've made a huge shift I think in terms of how we think about it um, try to get much more out in front and look at it. all of us are collectively working for the same objective here right so um, we're in a bit of a transition I guess I would say Peter, you wanted to comment? Yeah, yeah no, I, I think we shouldn't uh, lose sight also that in Sweden then we've had a, a big transformation of forestry in the past 30 years, also when it comes to nature conservation. Uh, at the same time as we've had all these nice upgoing curves on <coughs> harvests and volumes and, and the climate benefit, we've also had an outgoing curve on, on, on the nature conservation since 30 years when we had a new forest law. And that's beginning to pay off big time. And it's only, I mean, this is a slow turning ship. So it's only now that you can start seeing data on how, how much has actually been transformed. And it's a lot. We see it in our annual forest statistics. We're getting um, better nature conservation, more old trees, more uh, deciduous trees, more dead wood, etc. Mm. And it's going to increase in, in that direction. So we shouldn't lose sight of that. And, and uh, probably possible to make a presentation that harvesting is good for biodiversity too. For well, next conference. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions on that topic? Then uh, before I let you go, at least for the ones who are closer to the industry, sort of, it seems it's all very smooth sailing right now. Right? You talked about 33% return on capital employed, I think sort of for this SCI as a whole. Mm -hmm. The wood products division seem to be between anywhere between 50 and 85 percent returns of capital, which is amazing. What could crash the boat if that has been smooth sailing? Um, what keeps you awake at night? Uh, if I ask, sort of start with Lars Joran, you, you talk with lots of different companies and how they see it. What's your view? I mean, you, you have to, I mean, then, I mean, you have to think about what, what is you probably need to oh use sorry. the right. <laughs> What's the time horizon that uh, you're talking about? I mean, short term, you can see a lot of threats, I think, with the war, the geo geopolitical situation, the macroeconomic situation, the in increasing interest rates and inflation and so on that will have a dampening effect of housing, or mm. these activities, for the short term. But, I mean, in the long term, this supply-demand balance, these other mega drivers that we discussed, I think is a very positive outlook for wood, wood products. And as, as I said earlier, I, I think that when I talk to my clients globally, these policy paradoxes that I talked about, there's a lot of policy proposals trying to reduce supply, store, have the forests standing in the forest, there is a lot of restrictions, uh, old growth protection, whatever, and then build more in wood, uh, biophilia benefits and so on. It's not so easy to navigate in that in a holistic way. How do you balance these mm -hmm. that want to reduce supply and want to boost demand. I think that, that's a challenging act and how do, you, how do you make that story, how do you get the balanced story out to the policy makers? I mean, take just the European Union, a lot of countries doesn't have any forest industry. Mm -hmm. and forestry for them is parks, for recreation. So, so that, that, that is, I think, a challenge also to have a story to tell yeah. in the policy sector. Yeah. Stefan, what keeps you awake at night? Hmm. <laughs> uh, Professionally. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I thought about the question, and uh, we're in the, in the building industry, so we're, we're not in the same league when we talk about uh, revenues and EBITDA and so on. So we have uh, the margins we talk about is about uh, two or three or four percent. Mm. So uh, we are flying this jumbo jet at a very low uh, altitude. <laughs> <laughs> so that is what's uh, bothering me. So keeping it stable and keeping not, it not, stable. not have the nose dip too no. much. Ulf? I mean, I agree with uh, Lars Jöran. It is um, just now, of course, uh, it is a good time, but, but uh, the war and, and the consequences out of that, inflation, higher interest rates, 
that uh, I mean that will have a negative impact on building activities on consumption in in many areas. I, I suppose. I mean, mm. uh, if that's for example. But in long term, again, we have a lot of things talking for the forest and for the forest industry, of course. So, so, so I'm optimistic. But I mean, short term, it might be so that we we will see something that is not as good as this year and the year before <laughs> next year, <laughs> coming years. Yeah. Lars, do you share that? Uh, yeah, well, uh, absolutely. Um, I think the only thing I'd like to add to that is, is that, you know, the last, I've only been in this industry for two years, and the e number of external shocks we've had with COVID, <laughs> with the war, with the energy crisis now, with inflation, <laughs> right? So I think there's a big risk that we lose sight of the long-term mm -hmm. opportunity if we get, I, I don't know, to distract is probably a too low word for it, but to deal with this, these type of shocks, right, is a major challenge, right? That's Excellent. probably the one thing that keeps me awake. Interesting. Don? Yeah, I would two things. I would say short-term, hopefully short-term anyway, affordability overall, which, which is a, com a combination, I think, what, what you've all sort of spoken about, and the impacts of that, I think we're, we're certainly going to see, I think, over the next 24 months, probably. Um, it's just, you know, with the way the inflation's gotten to the extent that it's gotten away like it has. Um, so I'm definitely concerned about that and the impacts. And then the other one for us really is people. And it's, it differs mm -hmm. a lot by region. So in Sweden, it's not such a big issue. We don't have a lot of turnover here. But in, in the U.S., particularly in the U.S. South, I was da down there just a couple weeks ago, even last week, we have 50 to 75 percent turnover. Yes. And, and we don't, you know, as an industry, we really don't understand really why. It's hard to get close to the people to really understand why. But as you look forward, um, you know, it's, it's the, to attract and retain the caliber of people that we need mm. for the future as, as our as roles get more technical and you know and you want you know as people to think a lot more uh, about innovation those sorts of things it is really really difficult and and the and the, and the changing re needs and requirements of these folks that we're hiring now they're not they're not worried about um, they're not really worried about wages at all it's it's all the benefits that go with that and the mm. biggest benefit now <coughs> is additional vacation days <laughs> number one for sure and you know, and, and they don't and they don't really care about their short term um, uh, wages and so forth because they don't plan to stay any more than a year or two or three anyway. And so the challenge that we got is how do we get them again? It's kind of a story out again that this industry, if there's ever a time to be in it, it's today. And as you look forward to the next five, ten, twenty years, I mean, it's, it's got to be one of the best industries that, uh, that you know people can set themselves up to develop a career in, right? So we, again, it comes down to the story, get the narrative out, and th there's just a ton of work that has to go into that. And I think we're kind of, uh, all of us collectively realizing that, certainly in North America, but that's our s by far our biggest single challenge, I would say. Both sustainability and high tech, how can that not be an attractive thing? Uh, Stefan, did you want to add yes, something? Yes, I uh, forgot one thing about keeping me awake at night, yeah. and it's a positive thing. Uh, and that is uh, that uh, the government of Sweden has decided to uh, uh, take action when we talk about climate uh, footprint from a regulation point okay. of view. Because when we get there, then we hope that people are prepared to, to pay for uh, uh, sustainable production. I today, nobody pays for it. At least from the point of view, when we do the checks with our customers they are they what the cost of the project uh, they will deliver in time and with the right uh, quality mm. and the the, the climate uh, part uh, or the carbon footprint part comes very very low mm. on, on the demand side so when the municipalities and so on decides to put uh, labels and num numbers of the footprints uh, we will get there and it's a good thing good. and last but not least Lotta I think it's always important to be humble and uh, my belief is that long-term profitability comes from healthy value chains and uh, I, I think at the end of the day you said two three percent uh, we see uh, paper makers that are also suffering from heavy heavy energy pricing mm. and and uh, high pulp prices if not, maybe not in northern Sweden but in in Europe mm. right and I think at the end of the day you need balance and you need that's what you want to be part of so I, I, I think there will be some type of balancing in this in order for this to be long-term uh, sustainable um, and I think that's in a way a good thing so that's where I'm very good mm. thanks so much and that wraps up the program for this seminar mm. I think we owe a great thanks to our uh, academy hosts Eva and Kosella 
to the people who've organized this conference and attracted these amazing speakers, and of course, absolutely to the speakers themselves. Thank you so much. <laughs> And I think there'll be some kind of refreshments outside uh, for those who want. Up there, yes. <laughs>